চাফা পটাস হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ নমস্কার গুড মর্নিং স্যার গুড মর্নিং স্যার ভালো আছেন তো হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ এই তো অনলাইন ঠিক আছে হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ আমি বললা হ্যাঁ বল বল হ্যাঁ বলছি যে ওই স্যার কাছে ওই স্পিনটা একটা পেন ড্রাইভে নিতে চাই প্রমোট যে হুম আমি বলছি যে এই যে খামে ঢুকিয়ে দিচ্ছি কি লিখব ফলে আজকে অবস্থা মোটামুটি ভালো নয় পাঁচ মিনিট বলে চলে যাও হ্যাঁ অবস্থা ভালো নয় মানে এমন চলছে প্রত্যেক সময়ে মানে কন্টিনিউস এই ঝামেলার মধ্যে আছি আমরা আজকাল সাজ পোশাক নিয়ে খুব কনসার্ন হয়ে গেছি হ্যাঁ আমরা আজকাল সাজ পোশাক নিয়ে খুব কনসার্ন হয়ে গেছি হ্যাঁ এক মানে তো এক মানে তো সাজ পোশাক করা ও সাজ পোশাক সাজ সাজ পোশাক হ্যাঁ আমি শুনলাম শ্বাস প্রশ্বাস ভালো <laughs> সাজবে <laughs> <laughs> যদি ঝামেলাটা ওদের মাথার উপর চাপিয়ে দিতে পারতাম আমি বলছি না কন্যারা ঝামেলা কিন্তু মুসির হলো যদি যদি অসুবিধে গুলো ওনাদের মাথার উপর চাপিয়ে দিতে পারতাম যে এবার আপনারা সলভ করে দিন আমরা শুরু করবো তাহলে শুরু করে দিই নাকি জি বিগ ডাটা সাবার সিকিউরিটি তো দিসুয়ালি দা আউটরিচ প্রোগ্রাম অফ আর সি বোর্ড সেন্টার আচ্ছা শোনা যাচ্ছে in this in every sphere of our life today's life we are so intended to spread this knowledge and discuss the possibilities of these applications with the students in some interactive manner or that for this uh we have a fantastic group of speakers today also including professor bimal rai so without wasting time i invite dr shukla hazra principal of East Calcutta Girls College to deliver her welcome address. Good morning. I uh, welcome first uh, Dr. Bashuk Chaudhuri, Honorable Vice Chancellor of West Bengal State University and Professor Bimal Roy, Head of RC Board Center for Cryptology and Security ISI. And uh, this is the brainchild of Professor Bimal Roy. and also we uh, today we will get professor uh, shubhoy moitro and professor pinak pani pal from indian institute of uh, social institute of uh, uh, 
ISI, Indian Technical Institute, Mr. Kushal Shen, Microsoft Corporation, and Professor Ovishek Odhikari, Presidency University. And uh, already Professor Jointo Ghosh uh, uh, spoke about the topic that is cryptology, big data, and cybersecurity. We know that it is very important today's, in today's life for our own security for and all the security of uh, the institution, also big data for disaster management in the sphere. We uh, and, uh, and uh, Professor Vimal Roy, who is also the chairperson of National Statistical Commission, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, Government of India, he uh, gives, uh, me, gives me the uh, opportunity to organize such type of workshop. And we are organizing this workshop for last three years uh, in association with ISI, and where professors directly teach the school students and also college students about cryptology. And today, there is also they talk about the big data. And two years, we arranged uh, six to seven workshops or seminar per year, but in 2020, due to pandemic situation, it goes down because it was tough time. Now we are arranging these workshop online. So I must say that uh, COVID-19, though it is a curse to the whole world, but we learn a lot from this, we learn how to accommodate the new system and new technology in teaching and learning also. There may be a teach, I hope that there may be a change in teaching and learning process because as a principal of a general degree college, I, uh, I have the, uh, my experience that a few students who could not attend class daily for distances, they are attending the classes online. So now the thing is, we are talking about the hybrid system. Sometimes they may physically present in the class and sometimes they may attend online. Like this, in this uh, today's seminar, students from Scottish Church College Jadupur University and also students from NIT Dugapur, IIT Kharagpur, IIT Kanpur and other colleges, many colleges, students are attending this seminar. We cannot ask them to come daily to this uh, physically sometimes, but uh, it is possible only for online workshop. When, when I arranged a map quiz for online, I have seen that students from remote villages, they attend the map quiz. They never thought of coming to Calcutta and they are getting chances. So this is the good side of the COVID-19 and we will change to that. And I must welcome again all participants, all resource persons, honorable resource persons to this workshop. And also again, thank Professor Bimal Roy to give me this opportunity and also Professor Bashup Choudhury who also give, gives me this opportunity to organize this seminar and workshop on behalf of East Calcutta Girls College, all uh, staff members, I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, madam, for your such a warm address. And it's always a matter of great pleasure to us having Professor Bashuk Chudhuri, Vice Chancellor at Wisdom State University, in this program. And uh, today, particularly in spite of his very uh, busy schedule, as NAC committee is visiting his university yesterday, today, and tomorrow, he has kindly joined us for a very big period. So we are really thankful to him and waiting his very impressive lecture. So I give back Professor Choudhury for his brief inaugural speech. Uh, Babu, could I start? Yes, sure. Babu, could I start? Huh, sure, sure. Huh. Okay, uh, with, permission, with, per huh, with permission from huh, huh. all of you, 
with permission from all of you a respected professor bimal roy a respected principal of the east calcutta girls college dr shukla hajra um, and uh, my dear colleagues uh, shubhamoy pinakpani uh, from the indian statistical institute jayanto babu um, uh, the person coming from uh, microsoft and dr obishek odikari professor obishek odikari and all all others who are who are present over here and the participants um, indeed uh, it is a very busy day for uh, all of us from uh, yesterday uh, 7 o'clock to uh, 9 o'clock or 9:30 uh, it continued the nag visit in um, in my university and today also the nag visit has started and uh, we are all in the university and uh, from time to time i am being called to uh, to um, uh, clarify some of the points um, that are being raised by the nac committee so the, for the first time in the first cycle we are uh, doing this um, exercise and um, uh, let's see what goes uh, what uh, what other what comes out of this exercise uh, anyway uh, the uh, seminar or the webinar that is being organized today that is on cryptology cyber security and big data or cryptology big data and cyber security and uh, the whole initiative behind this uh, program has been taken by professor bimal roy he wanted the students of schools and colleges to understand what lies in future in terms of mathematics in terms of statistics in terms of big data and in terms of cyber security all of you know that all these are emerging areas and in emerging areas it is necessary to visualize what will happen it is necessary to also uh, orient one oneself towards uh, taking a uh, career uh, as they as as one grows up so that is the kind of idea with which this uh, webinar or the webinars are being organized Uh, behind this uh, 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 whole exercise uh, 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 professor bimal roy played a very very important role and he uh, basically got some funds from the uh, department of science and technology or department of statistics and wanted to create an awareness in students about uh, the future scenario about the subjects that are that are emerging so um uh, that is what uh, you know i just wanted to uh, i'm getting message and getting distracted so um, uh, getting message and getting dist distracted uh, what's up messages are coming uh, you know with uh, so point is you know all of you know the big data you know a large number of data all of you know the Uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of data that is being generated in hadron collider hadron collider every second large every millisecond you know the particles are being formed and particles are being destroyed and huge quantity of data are being produced and it is necessary to discern which data will be important and which data will not be important which will be statistically significant which will not be statistically significant which will throw up some light about the structure of the universe and the birth of the universe and which will uh, not be that important so the point is you know this discerning this data and the mechanism all these are important and they are all jobs of mathematicians and statisticians who work in this area of 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 big data all of you know about cyber security because everything is going on now Uh, uh particularly in this covid uh, situation we know that all of us are working on uh, uh, internet and all of, all of us are working on uh, systems now when we are working on computer systems what really happens is the information that is being sent you know uh, very simple example will be a false email coming from one source to the other uh, one source to a sink coming from one source to to me how do i know whether it is it is a correct mail or or not you know a large number of uh, data you know someone is saying that you know put your uh, uh, put your uh, income tax i mean uh, assess uh, what is called um, um, you know the pen um, and uh, you will this much amount will be credited in your account 
Now this is a false email. We, we immediately know because it is in terms of money it is important you know but the point is you know you come here i will uh, we will have a cup of tea uh, together that is that is something you know that is also a false email but i will not be able to discern whether it is a false false email or not how do i know so these are some of the things you know a large data large uh, you know question of security you you are maintaining your defense system in the country you are maintaining your finance system of the country you are maintaining your Hello. confidential system of the country and all these are being maintained on computers all these are on are being maintained on clouds and no one can enter into the cloud without the password and the security system and how do you create that kind of security system <clears throat> and professor bimal rai is the best person to say he always tells about the key of the locker and uh, now it is uh, something like digi locker that the ugc is saying where the digital mark sheets and certificates will be kept and then there will be you know academic bank of credit that also will be maintained um, uh, on the on the uh, cloud or on, on computer system so all these how are they really made you know the virtual world you know the real world that we are seeing that we are going by uh, uh, bus or we are going by uh, auto or we are going by auto rickshaw or we are going by uh, you know car or something and you know the real world is uh, emerging and we see that the we see the real world but the virtual world how does it look like and how does how do you work so that is something that will be talked about in this particular uh, seminar or in this particular webinar uh, the east calcutta girls college and the principal took initiative to uh, to um, work as the person in charge to disseminate this information you know information flow is not uh, you know uh, does not happen from the uh, source to seeing directly information goes from one sector to other and then you know it does for example you know if you see the hierarchy uh, the, from the prime minister information does not come directly to the uh, to the lowest possible level unless you know unless uh, he directly addresses them from the chief minister honorable chief minister it does not come directly to the to the masses it will come gradually from officer to officer so similarly for the cyber security or for the data to flow information to flow information will also flow in a particular way and you know correct information will be screened bad information will be uh, will be uh, thrown out and in this manner we will process how are those things done how are the, how will that structure be built up how will uh, we know that uh, this is a data that uh, that is to be uh, to be banked upon and this is a data that is to be thrown out so thrown away so these are some of the points that uh, needs to be uh, to be to be uh, talked about and i think that the best possible speakers of the indian statistical institute the microsoft and the presidency university they will be here to talk about the uh, Uh, importance of the subject and i am sure that it will create a lot of impact on your mind so uh, i will not um, uh, uh, you know elongate my speech uh, i will end here uh, by saying uh, you know all good wishes to all of you thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity and i wish all of you well i thank uh, professor bimal roy all the other speakers professor uh, dr shukla hajra uh, dr joyant ghosh who has been tirelessly working uh, who has been working for long for a long time um, uh, years together to um, inform and create awareness in students so i thank all of them for giving me this opportunity and because of you know the necessity of this uh, uh, you know my uh, own uh, involvement in this nac process i will uh, uh, request your permission to go out of this meeting and i wish you all well thank you thank you very much thank you thank you professor chaudhary for your beautiful and it uh, is enlightening address thank you very much now we are ending in our main program uh the first talk will be delivered by professor bimal kumar rai and uh, is quite you know already you have heard about him and uh, professor you know already j professor roy is one of the pioneer in this field of ecology and he is the key person to establish a center for excellence to study this information security in eastern india that is a super set of cryptology and security in isi being a renowned statistician 
of our time. Professor Rai served as a director of Indian Statistical Institute, and at present he is chairman of National Statistical Commission. For his contribution towards education, Government of India honored him by conferring Padmasri Award. So now I request Professor Rai to deliver his talk. Okay. Good morning. Uh, shall I speak in uh, Bengali or English? Uh, one of the Maybe in English participants may tell. So many outsiders. Are... Oh, is it? Uh, uh, okay. Okay then. Maybe in the... English. Okay. Okay. Then maybe let me start with English. Uh, this time I have uh, I finally got my colleague. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm. I'm continuing. So this time, since I got my colleague uh, Shubhamai Mitra to speak. So I leave it uh, him to introduce the subject cryptography. Instead, I'll, I'll talk something else uh, which is relevant to both big data and cryptology. So I'll tell you two stories, and you have to think about the uh, two stories uh, for a couple of days. So what I meant. So the first story uh, goes about. Um, this is about uh, Sir Ronald Fisher, uh, who is considered to be the father of modern statistics. He was a professor at Cambridge. And uh, this incident uh, will, will be eye opener to many of us, and and this is very deep, even though it's a story. So you know this uh, the habit of drinking tea, and that I'm now drinking tea. Came to India with the British. We, we had no system of drinking tea. The British um, got tea to India, and the British style of drinking tea was to mix with milk. And as well as sugar. So now it's only last 20-25 years. All these things started like with uh, with sugar, without sugar, with milk, without milk, and so on and so forth. But the traditional British tale was: if a guest comes to your house, you offer a cup of tea prepared with milk and sugar, and some a few cookies, which what we call biscuits. So. One day, Sir Fisher went to his friend's house, and his friend's wife uh, offered him a cup of tea, as usual, uh, the British style, and some cookies. And then suddenly, a question came to his mind: you know, All these great people have a very different way of think, uh, thinking, the, uh, different mindset. Something pops up into their mind, and that creates, uh, I think, a history in science. So he asked his friend's wife. Madam, um, how did you prepare the tea? Now let me talk about how do the British prepare tea. Um, they will boil water. They will have a pot where they put the tea leaves. Okay, and then after the water has completely boiled, so they will pour the water um, on the tea leaves and allow it to brew it for a few minutes. Now the option. Now some of them. Also put sugar while brewing, expecting the sugar will be a good mix. It will mix well, uh, but some of them do not do not put sugar uh, while brewing. So after a few minutes of brewing, uh, it is filtered, and milk is added, and sugar is added if sugar was not added while brewing. So there are two two methods. There are two methods. One is where see. Water is boiled. It's uh, the tea leaves are uh, are brewed. That's uh, common. Milk is added at the end. That's also common. But when do we add the sugar? While brewing or after filtering? That is the two different uh, procedures. So he asked, uh, "Madam, Madam, how did you uh, prepare your tea? Did you add sugar while brewing, or did you add sugar after filtering?" And the madam said, "Oh, I always uh, add sugar after filtering." Then Sir Fisher asked her, "Is, is there any particular reason for this?" This is of course because if you put the sugar while brewing, the tea tastes horrible. And then uh, Sir Fisher asked her, "Can you really distinguish?" Uh, by, by taking, um, drinking a few sips of the tea, whether the uh, sugar was added while brewing or after filtering, 
He said, of course, that one, uh, if it is prepared by, uh, by adding sugar after a few times, it will taste good. And if uh, sugar was added while well brewing, it will taste horrible. It's very easy to uh, distinguish. He says, is that your belief? Or uh, you think this is the truth? Uh, you, you know yourself very well. So, of course, this is not my belief. This is perfectly true for myself. Okay. So, here is a, 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 a question or a, or a concept is defined here. Is it belief or is it truth? Okay. Now, we normally start with a belief. No matter what is the background or the domain or the scenario, people do have their beliefs. Okay, and this is what we call hypothesis. Okay, but now, uh, if you're a scientist, uh, we just don't accept beliefs as truth. So we have to have certain additional analysis of this belief, maybe with the help of some data and, 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 and some procedures followed. At the end of which, you can say, yes, the belief is, is better, the belief is okay. Else, I would say it's only a belief. The belief has. Uh, is not validated, so the belief is probably not right. So this is a scientific way of telling that. Now, how do we come to uh, this kind of conclusion? Start a belief. In this case, we started the belief that Madam can distinguish the two kinds of teas prepared: sugar added after filter or sugar added while filter. Well, 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 well. So, sir, um, sir Fisher um, tells sir that you make that you, you please play a game with me. See, bring me two pots of tea, one pot of tea uh, prepared, put in sugar while brewing, and one pot of tea, you add sugar after filter. So, so she gets, so she gets uh, one pot here, sugar was added uh, while brewing, another pot uh, after filter, she was added. So, Sir Fisher puts it on the table, on the list two corners. Okay, left hand side. Type one, left to, uh, right hand side, type two. Then he says, Madam, you get me 10 cups. So she gets 10 cups. Below five cups, Sir Fisher writes one, 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 and puts it on the left hand side. And below the other five cups, he writes two, 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 and puts it on the right side. And then he pours tea from the first uh, pot, the type 1 kind, to, into the cups below which we have written 1. And on the right side is another, another 5 cups, so he pours uh, tea from the other pot where uh, the tea was made using procedure 2. And now say, Madam, you just take away the um, 2 pots. Now 5 cups, type 1, 5 cups, type 2. And then what he does, he kind of makes movement of the cup around the table and what you call randomize. He randomizes so that now she doesn't know which cup is from method one, which cup is from method two. It's all completely mixed. Then he says, okay, madam, uh, you take one cup at a time, take a few sips and tell me this is good or this is horrible. That means method one or method two. And she said, this is a very trivial thing. I'll uh, just take one sip and immediately I'll be um, uh, telling it correctly. So I'll tell all the 10 correctly. He said, okay, okay. That's your belief. So let's try to play the game to validate your belief. So, okay, then, uh, you know, since we do statistics, we, we assume that people can do some error. So I allow you some error. Now then he asked, uh, even if anyone has no Capability of distinguishing between two between these two varieties of tea, how many can one can tell correctly? Okay, answer is very simple. Uh, so this is where I actually lag uh, this uh, physical interaction. Normally, I want my audience to answer this question, but here you know this is a little complicated, so I have to answer the question. So this will be five. Uh, see, on one hand, you just say all of them are of type one. Okay, then this will be uh, five of them will be correct. Even if we say randomly, we have no power to distinguish say randomly, then also this is going to be uh, um, five correct randomly, hopefully. 
Okay, so this this one gives no information telling five correctly about your capability of distinguishing, of distinguishing these two varieties of tea. So what you do? Um, now you may do some mistakes. So I allow that if you tell even nine correctly, that means you do one mistake. Okay, or maybe you have two mistakes. Okay, I will assume that um, your belief is true. But if you do more than two mistakes, then I will. You have to accept that it is only your belief. You have no valid reason behind your belief. Okay. So the game is played, uh, and the lady tells that is six or seven correctly. Okay, and this means is that uh, it's only a belief, and she accepts that it's only a belief. Uh, she doesn't really distinguish between these two kinds of things. Now, what is the implication of this story? The, the entire development of statistics, even now, big data, machine learning, all this thing started, I think the root is in this story. So, what we have, we have, uh, we start with some belief. Okay? And then we have to find some data. So this is also we have to generate data or we have to look for data and relevant data by which we can possibly validate this belief or reject the belief. So need of data, right kind of data. So here the, uh, the right kind of data was generated by Sir Fisher. By this game or by this experiment, he has generated the data. What is the data? He has created the experiment and then the response of the lady after testing each cup. So that is the um, generation of data. So it would be an experiment generate data if you are doing physics, chemistry, biology, or if you are in public, uh, it could be on the public data. So pertinent to a belief, you have to know what is the relevant data which you are going to use for uh, accepting or rejecting your belief. So then there must be methodology of this validating. So yes, methodology, methodology was that uh, she will drink this cup of tea and will tell uh, yes and no. And then, depending on the number of right answers she gives, and we decide the threshold. And what is the meaning of this threshold? The meaning of threshold is that um, beyond the threshold, our belief is going to be true. Below the threshold, our belief is going to be wrong. So we have to set up this uh, threshold. And when we uh, set up the threshold, we also think of the error probabilities. So depending on how much error we are going to allow, since we believe that uh, everybody is going to some error, uh, so what we do, we actually uh, decide a threshold. And this is also part of methodology, a rule of inference. And with the threshold of the experiment, at the end of the uh, day, you either accept or reject your belief. But this entire process, was not there before this, this particular story. And now you would see in every sphere of life, probably maybe even in business domain, maybe in the security domain, you would see that you would start with certain belief. This is good, this is bad, this is not so good. Um, something like that. And then something like there is a belief at this point of time that uh, demonetization helped India become digital. So there is a belief. So, actual Reserve Bank of India is act making a detailed study to validate or reject this hypothesis. So, meaning that we have to see uh, how do we study this one? You know, there was a de demonetization happened. And then we have to see, first look for what kind of data. So, what is the hypothesis here? That the demonetization helped India becoming more digital. Okay, so we have to design this entire game. We have to see all the relevant data and how do we handle this data? What do we analyze? How do we make a rule of inference? By which, at the end of the day, we should be able to say, yes, uh, it helped in making India digital, or uh, we may say that it didn't quite help India become digital. Some digital progress, but not really significant digital progress. So, this kind of things are very pertinent. And the root of all this methodology uh, lied in this particular story. Okay, this is my uh, story number one. And the second story, um, 
I think uh, since you and I will introduce cryptology, but I'll tell the story, uh, which will help you understand what the talks later on. So this goes to my high school days. Um, in my high school, we used to have every monthly test for each subject. And we write the test, the teacher will write down our names and put the scores against our names. Okay, and then sign it, fold it, put it in an envelope, uh, seal it with a gum, and then uh, gives our peon, uh, take it to the headmaster. And the peon takes it to the headmaster. And then one day our math teacher told, uh, is, it, is it very safe? Uh, and we understand what is meant by this is not being safe. He so, said, you know, opening these envelopes are very easy. The helper, the other peon makes tea for the teachers. There is some, some small office room and there will be electric heater and a kettle of water which will boil and the steam comes out. And he said, if you hold this uh, sealed portion of the envelope before the steam, the gum will loosen. Okay, and uh, envelope will open. You can take that uh, piece of paper where the, our scores are written out and you can change uh, the scores and then you can sell it with the gum and the peon will give it to the headmaster. So the scores that you are finally getting is assigned by the peon, not by me. And then what is the remedy? So he said, I have thought of a remedy. Uh, and what is the remedy? He says, you know, uh, just you know what are Apache cases. You know, I don't see much many attaches at these days. Now, time attaches are very popular. These are you know, small, very hard, uh, hard boxes, and they have two locks at the two ends, and the two keys. One key will open the right hand side box, and the other key will open the left hand side box. And unless you open both the sides, the attaches cannot be open. And in our time, attaches was so popular. I remember in my wedding, I got I received maybe six or seven attaches. So this was uh, that popular. So what we, uh, she said, I, 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 I will use an attache case, but very small size. I'm only going to send a piece of paper to the headmaster. I don't need, uh, I, do, I don't need to put my clothes and papers, etc. Just one paper. So I get a very small attache case. But the property remains the same. It's a hard, hard box, difficult to break. And then there are two locks and two ends and two keys. You have to open both of them to open this, open this attache case. Then he said, okay, one key I'll keep with me, and the other key I leave it with the headmaster. Headmaster is the other key. So what he does, he says, I'll put the score sheet inside that attache case and lock my side with my key. And then as the peon, I will take it to the headmaster. Now the peon cannot open it. No steam are coming out of this uh, boiling water in the kettle is going to open this one. This is hard one. Uh, presumably this can be broken so easily. So this is um, the safer. But when you take it to the headmaster, the headmaster can't open because the headmaster doesn't have the key to this one. The headmaster cannot open it. So what headmaster will do? He will put the key, his key to his side of the uh, lock. So on the other side, there's a lock. I, I don't have the key, only the headmaster has the key. So headmaster is going to lock that side. So now it's both the side locked. And then you will see the peon. Now we take it to the teacher. So the peon gets it back to the teacher. And what the teacher does, he has his, with, with the key for his lock. So he's going to open that lock. Still the other side lock. And then he tells the peon, you take it to the headmaster again. And the headmaster with his key opens this one. Okay. And the headmaster gets a piece of paper. Now what has been achieved in this, this example? Number one, uh, using this hard, hard metal body uh, or some, some other uh, synthetic uh, material body attaching case, you are making it's difficult for somebody to break this one. In the other case, that steam was loosening the gum and you could open the. But here, you are making that difficult. 
for the person who is, who is trying to get access to that, that paper. Okay, two other things I achieved this way. So I know for sure the headmaster, only the headmaster can really open this uh, attache and get access to this piece of paper in my mark sheet. And also the headmaster is assured that it has been sent by this particular teacher, nobody else. So this is what I call you know, authentication. So the sender authenticates the receiver, so nobody else can receive except the person who is meant to be meant to receive it. So the receiver authenticates the sender because the receiver knows it has come from this sender and from nobody else. So these two authentications uh, are, are actually materialized here. And this, in a sense, in a letter part, uh, which is now called public cryptography, which is uh, which is the key of uh, one of the, this uh, communication this day. I think probably she will talk about that. And I'll probably end with a, a third story of mine um, relating, relating, you can think of it, how to relate this one. Um, so this is uh, something like when, okay, let me tell you the story and then I'll tell you how to use this one. Um, now I have two nieces. I do have two nieces. They are almost similar age. One, one is from my, one is Bhagni, my sister's daughter, one is my brother's daughter, Baiji. Uh, they are almost the same age. And if I have to get a gift for one niece, I have to get the identical gift uh, from the, uh, for the next, uh, for the other niece. So every time I need to give them some gift, I have to get two identical objects. Okay, now, I'm blind. We assume that I'm blind. I cannot see. So I trust uh, maybe uh, Professor Shukla Hajra. I told um, Dr. Hajra, please get me two identical pens. Okay. And she gets it. And I trust her. So she says, I know that you trust me, but still, I want to prove to you that I have got two identical pens for your two nieces. So she wants to prove to me that she has got two identical pens and I cannot see. If I could see, there is uh, no issue. I can see and find out, but I cannot see. So she tells, okay, let's play a game. I'll design a game. And maybe uh, she trusts uh, Bashob, your uh, our vice chancellor. Bashab uh, Chaudhary says, now let Bashab Chaudhary and you play a game. What is the game? Uh, she says, you take the two pens in your two hands. Just let me see. So I hope you can see. Uh, and someone can tell me, uh, at least uh, unmute and tell me, are these two pens identical? Someone unmute and tell me? No, sir. No, right. So, so Dr. Haja tells me to take these two pens in two hands, take the hands at the back. Okay. And then you may interchange your two hands or you may not interchange your two hands. Okay. So it was like this. I take it at the back and I do something you cannot see and I bring it and I ask. Did I interchange my hands? Someone tell me. Did I interchange my hands? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Now remember this one. Then again, I take it to the back. Did I interchange my hands? No, sir. No, no sir. right. Interchange my hands? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. Now, now these two are not identical. So you would be correct all the time. Right? But if these two, these two are identical? Yes, sir. Right? Now, <laughs> tell me, did I interchange my hands? No. no. You, don't, you don't know. You don't know. 
they are identical if I, whether I interchange my hands or not, it will remain the same. Isn't it? If they are identical, you won't know if I interchange my hands or not. Right? One of you answer. Yes, sir, we can't say. You can say, so you have to guess. So, uh, Madam Hajra tells me, let Bashav Babu and you play the game. And if Bashav Babu tells, or, say maybe the, the, the 10 times. And if Bashav Babu tells all the 10 times correctly, then these two pens are not identical. Isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And if, if he does the mistake even once, Okay, then we know that these two pens are identical. Right. So she is, Madam Hajj is proving to me through this game that these two pens are identical or not. Identical. Okay, even though I am blind. But this is what is called, you will know later on, what is called zero knowledge uh, proofs. Zero knowledge proofs. And this, what we are trying to use in reality, when you go for voting in a voting booth. And how how does how do you prove that you are the you are the same person, the the polling officer? You show your voter ID card, okay? And what the polling officer does looks at the voter ID card, looks at your photo, and makes and they have also a printout of the of the same photo uh, in their list. So the polling officer will verify all the three. Your voter ID card, the voter ID card copy uh, in, in their record, and your physical appearance. And the voter ID card is going to, so they are going to, and also they'll, they'll probably ask you to put a signature. Now, all these things are not good enough to stop forging. Okay? So there will be notion of myself proving to the polling officer that this is myself and nobody else. Okay, so we are trying to use this kind of zero knowledge things for, for, for even elections. You are used to use OTPs, right? What are the OTPs? The bank want to prove, make sure that you are the right person and nobody else. Isn't it? You, you, you have a mobile, so you are supposed to, okay, if I give you a slap and take your mobile, that's a different thing. Assuming that your mobile is held with you, when the bank says OTP before any transaction is made, and if you can, read the OTP and type it in, then the bank knows that it's me and nobody else. So this is also one way of what I call uh, zero knowledge proof. You're proving your identity. So in this internet domain, identity is going to be an issue. And the way you prove your identity, there are many methods. One method is what I told this game, this is called zero knowledge proof. Okay, so let me stop here. Uh, we are the speakers. So thank you all and if you have any questions, uh, Jayanto, you may share my email ID with all of them at the end of the, uh, 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 the, the webinar series and you can send me emails and you can trust me, I, I respond in 24 hours. Okay, Jayanto, over to you. Now, show who is there. So. Jayanto. Okay. Okay, thank you, Professor Rai, for your most valuable and insightful talk. The profound the profoundness of your vision that will obviously enrich us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Now, I invite Professor Shubhamai Moitro to deliver his talk. Professor Moitro is a professor of Indian Statistical Institute and obviously a top-notch cryptologist of our country. But in public domain, he is uh, quite a uh, known face as regular in different TV news channels as an expert in different social and political programs. His keen observation of these socio-political contemporary issues also reflected in his articles published, in, published regularly in different print medias. Uh, different newspapers, obviously, and also especially in famous Desh Patrika. Obviously, today he will enrich us 
uh, obviously with his vision on cryptology and expert on cryptology so shuhoi babu shuhoi babu apni join korechen to okay okay so this is purely a technical talk and nothing related to my other involvement in social issues so this is absolutely a technical talk so i think you can listen to me right <clears throat> yeah can anybody just unmute and tell whether you are listening to me uh, is the sound going yes yes sir okay okay so i'm switching off the video because that then the bandwidth will be properly utilized uh, so the issue is uh, what we are discussing is we are discussing about cryptology and um, I, I won't talk for a long time but to give you some technical ideas uh, so i i believe you are all from science background so can you just quickly tell me a little bit that just just tell me that uh, which year and which department you are just just uh, unmute your mic and tell maybe for 30 seconds the second year mathematics second year mathematics okay good 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 then somebody else Uh, somebody else who will you please, please respond and you the participant please response so okay. just mention your uh, second year ceramic second year ceramic department okay so so hmm. what happens is actually uh, so this is some kind of test related to cryptology that most of you are actually uh, just logged in and switched off your microphone and the video and you should not listen so this is the standard thing i i am i'm very convinced about that because i also do the same thing so this is one random sampling that you ask a simple question and it will get you not get answer and then you, you actually immediately know how many are actually listening just by a sample okay but the, when there is a talk we should actually think of a little bit of Mm, what i would say that discussing about the technical things and at least one or two the probability that nobody is listening is really very low india mathematics <laughs> good good so we got three responses that's good out of 26 right uh, 16 at this moment there are 16 more to total 27 participants we got three responses uh, so we, we understand that First. first four. year computer science good four four responses then <laughs> first year general five, five six six remote right first year stat seven responses first year computer science eight responses good then i, I don't know the, the eight people are listening that's enough but now again what you can do you can just come out and then what i have to do then i have to sample okay so the point is when we are talking about cryptography it is really related to several subjects what are what are the subjects the subjects are mathematics physics computer science and any related subjects which have some scientific understanding now what is a scientific understanding scientific understanding is to write down some logical statements like if then else these kind of statements to come in come to a conclusion like i i think many of you may remember that the sum of internal angles of a triangle is how much 180 180 right so we need, we must have some proof for that and when we write down the proof we take some initial assumptions or we sometimes tell them postulates and calculate certain we write down certain steps that this is parallel to these these are the opposite angles and all these things by which you prove that it is really 180 degree so first of all we need to prove certain things so in cryptology the idea is of proving something so one important thing uh, since you are now in first year second year some of you might go into academics so the main problem we are facing nowadays is actually Uh, proving certain statement there are some statements uh, in in social issues like today how is the weather weather it is little cloudy today so you can uh, so how much sunshine is there that kind of question when you talk about a percentage and something 
and there are many parameters then it is sometimes very hard to actually get into certain exact value or telling about this happened but still there is some scientific idea that it is more or less cloudy today in kolkata so that also have some scientific description but if you tell that i toss a coin and uh, the output will be always head then these kinds of statements are actually absolutely wrong so and when we are proving something or uh, we are making some corollary we need to identify what we are proving what we are actually trying to prove in because complicated uh, expressions and all these things might be very hard to prove so it is easier to find out issues where we can actually try to identify what we want to prove the proof should be simple and it should be correct so this is one part of learning anything related to cryptology um, anything uh, which has relation to cryptology related subjects so the first thing i want to tell is when we are designing some software like you you log into this google meet software so there are generally the things work very fast right so unless the things work very fast if i log if i want to log in and i have a computer and through google meet if i i need something like 15 20 minutes time to log in then nobody would really like to log in so we need to write down softwares or me methods such that things can run quite fast we do not need to wait much in this direction i like to introduce you a little bit about computational complexity so can you just think of adding two five digit integers now when you do five add to five digit integers how do you add those integers you take the digits in the units place you add them and if there is a carry you add that carry with the next two digits which are in the tens place and this way you continue so can anybody calculate how many additions will be required in this step in this adding five digit numbers to five digit numbers how many digit additions are required can anybody tell okay for adding the units digit how many additions will be required sir minimum 5 or maximum 9 right very good so maybe there would be two additions in each step other than the units place and there would be one addition in each step that would be the best scenario so we can simply say that we need to go for two into n many additions at most which are digit additions to add two n digit numbers now what is the largest integer that i can produce with an n digit number what is the largest integer so okay five digit what is the largest integer of five digits largest integer with five digits so 99999 so it is almost 10 to the power 5 right it is in fact 10 to the power 5 minus 1 is it clear with three digits i can create 999 which is 10 to the power 3 minus 1 right so with n digits what is the largest number i can create 10 to the power n minus 1 now consider that when i am adding two n digit numbers the value of these numbers are 10 to the power of the number of digits now i am giving you another methodology for adding consider that you are adding 27 plus 36 but how you are adding after 27 you are counting 36 many times like 28 29 that way you will go and count up to 36 times and then you will get 63 so i think you understand that this method is absolutely not efficient is it clear so this the we can add two numbers even if those numbers are very large because we can do that very efficiently 
that means if there is a number which is of the value v then the number of operation to add to such numbers is actually log of v to the base 10 that is why we can add otherwise we could never add to large numbers this is called efficiency now come to multiplication so if there are two n digit numbers how many digit multiplication and addition are required to get the result can anybody tell i have two n digit numbers so the way we multiply we take one digit multiply with all the n digits of the upper number write them down the result put a cross in the right hand side again we multiply with the second number and do this this way and then after this digit multiplication we go for some additions so how many multiplication digit multiplications are required for in factorial no 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 n digits into n digits so n square many more or less multiplications oh see you take one yes, second sir. okay so it is n square right so that means this is another operation which is also very efficient there is you will get the same efficiency when you like to divide because divide divide division is actually some kind of multiplication when you will divide you will see that actually you are doing a multiplication you just understand the division process carefully same thing is the greatest common divisor or highest common factor which is known as in bengali it is told goshagu in english it is gcd or hcf that how do we do gcd or hcf can anybody comment on that if you know how do we do this thing will anybody respond okay so the way we did is we take one number divide it by another number and take the remainder and then we consider the remainder and the other number we keep on dividing this so the numbers become very small and i give you an assignment you do it that how many steps are required at most when you calculate the gcd you will be you will find that it requires very less number of divisions and already we told division needs the complexity or time something the operations something like multiplication so this is also a very efficient operation now we can do all the computations not because of fast computer we can do all these operations only because these operations men human beings or mathematicians or engineers or scientists they could find out that that there are algorithms there are strategies so that we can do these things very fast now if you have pen and paper then you can try this experiment you multiply 23 and 37 you will find that if you multiply 23 and 37 then finding the result will take at most 10 12 seconds even some some good people can solve it in one or two seconds but if you multiply 23 and 37 and do not tell your friend what you have multiplied and give him or her the result and ask him or her that okay can you factorize this for me you will find that this becomes very complicated this is actually the most interesting thing in this kinds of number theoretic algorithm we learned these things from our childhood say addition subtraction multiplication gcd and all these things <coughs> so, so we we learn these things from our childhood and it is very natural that when we learn these things in primary schools there is no requirement to understand why these are very efficient operations but as we go in college level and as we are 
studying mostly mathematics and computer science related things, then it is very important to understand these things that why multiplication, division and all these things are very efficient, but factorization is not. Why GCD is very efficient, but factorization is not. Because anybody will ask, okay, division is efficient, uh, factorization is some kind of division. Calculating GCD is very efficient. And if we can find GCD of two integers, then we can actually find out the factor, one factor quickly. So then what is the problem? So the advantage of GCD is if you have two numbers, where one number is P into Q and another number is Q into R, then you can quickly find out Q if the pair of numbers are given. But if I give you the product PQ, then you cannot do GCD. And then you also do not know how to find out another number so that taking GCD of these two numbers, I can immediately find out the factorization. So these things are very important that the mathematical operations, whatever you are seeing is happening very fast in computers. This getting into this Google Meet or using some Google app or whatever you are browsing, you are going through internet. You have to understand that behind all these things, there are algorithms which are actually very efficient. And once the situation is that the algorithms are not efficient, then it would be, it can never be used in general for computational purpose. But again, human being, they are really very clever. So they thought that, okay, we can use this for other purpose. Right? How do I do that? They started doing some kind of one-way function. One-way function is something like, so say there is an one-way function of fx comma y. What is that? You calculate fx comma y equal to xy. Then you can easily find out, given x and y, you can easily calculate x into y. But when you are talking about inverse of that function, that is, if I give you the product, can you come back to x and y very fast? The answer is no. So these kinds of things are actually used in public key cryptography, which started in early 70s. There are many stories of that. You can go through these stories through internet because the main problem in scientific development is there are government organizations where scientific, scientists also work. And when you are working in a government organization, then you are not supposed to tell what you are doing. So in the domain of cryptology or cryptography, which is very much related to defense sector in different government, the people who work, they cannot publish the results. And only those things are known uh, after a long time because they cannot tell these things. I'm not sure, I would suggest all of you to watch the movie uh, which portrays Alan Turing. Uh, do you know the name of this movie? Any of you? I think some of you might be knowing. So otherwise watch that movie today evening. That movie is the imitation game. This is related to the person Alan Turing who actually started computer science and did some very serious work in cryptology. So, and his, his life is around Second World War. Uh, an amazing character committed suicide at the age of 40 plus for several reasons. So you should, you should learn all those from the movie. So he, he, he understood a lot of things about cryptography and computer science, how those are related. So these are the things that we use for designing crypto systems like you have, um, I think uh, Professor Bimalra has already told you, consider that you have a post box outside your house. Presently, those things are generally not used, but there are two, two slits. One is the top slit through which anybody can come to your place and put a letter. But once the letter is put, anybody cannot bring that letter out. For bringing the letter out, you have to go to the post box with your key, open this and find, bring out the letters. So there are, you can see there are two keys here. One key is that is coming through the slit at the top of the post box, which you can call the public key. That means if anybody want to communicate to you, that person can 
communicate to you by encrypting something using your public key, but you can uh, only find out those things, the data, if you want to, uh, if you can, um, if you have a private key, which is the key through which you can open the law. So, this is the concept of a private and public key that I really do not want to explain mathematically because we do not have facility to do that at this point and we have to use blackboard or we need to be more, we need to concentrate much more, but you can easily search this over internet and you will find it was identified by uh, the public domain thing was told by Rivest Shamir and Adleman in something like 77, 78. It is known as RSA crypto system, which is very famous. It is used in, used in, presently being used in all the banking sectors for encryption and decryption, mostly. Now, so the, this, is, this is the thing which is actually dependent on that factorization is harder, but multiplication is easier based on that. This crypto system is developed. Now it was running quite well um, and still it is running quite well. But what happens 1980, 81, that time, Richard Feynman, Feynman is also a famous physicist. Uh, you might have uh, studied his book. There is a very famous book. Surely you are joking, Mr. Feynman. The physics students, they might read sometime lecture notes in physics by Feynman. There are three nice books. Uh, so he told in 1980s that the computers, those are based on classical things like electronic circuits and all these diode, triodes, transistors and all these. You can think of, so those are basically based on some kind of basic classical mechanics or Newtonian mechanics. You can think of quantum mechanics can also be used in computation. And then the theory research started and Peter showed in early 90s he could prove that factorization, which as long as we are told, telling, is very hard in classical domain, but that becomes very easy, like multiplication or division in a quantum computer. So that was told in early 90s. Immediately after it is told, people started becoming very careful that, okay, so now there is a theoretical model of quantum computer. Earlier, there is a theoretical model for classical computer in early 1900. And then during First World War, Second World War, computers, classical computers were coming. Uh, they were developing. And ultimately, by 80s, 70s and 80s, we have very good computers. Okay, the sizes were large. The size of a, uh, today we have a mobile phone. So if we have a mobile phone today, uh, the, the capacity of that phone, the computational power or the storage power of that mobile phone is equivalent to a room full of 20 almiras in uh, so something like that. So like when I, I can give you an example that in the railway reservation system during 19, early 1992-93, there were something like uh, uh, 10, 20 huge rooms with some hundred computers, each of them was of size of a big Alvira of your house. So those things can now be managed in just a mobile phone. So the computational power increased hugely after 1990 and so. So last 20, 30 years have, have seen huge development in terms of development of good classical computers. So now, when in 90s, people told about quantum computer and that it can factorize very fast, at least theoretically, then people thought that, okay, then it is a huge risk because if we can have a quantum computer very soon, then the complete banking sector will break. Complete. In the world, whatever money is there, anybody can just break that and take that money out through cryptographic systems. So then people started an effort to design actual commercial quantum computers. So almost after 30 years, now we understand that having a quantum computer might be possible, but still getting it in commercial domain, because say consider the, all the money in the world. 
Now, if building a quantum computer takes more money than that, then there is no meaning because you build a computer which costs more than all the money and then breaking the banks, you will not gain anything. So we need to have this in a low cost. That is still not possible. But at the same time, people thought that public key crypto system need to be revised. If you go to some USA website called NIST, possibly National Institute of Standard and Testing, something like that, they design all the public domain crypto systems. And whatever the Americans do, you know that we follow those things. Uh, we are bound to follow those things, something like that. Uh, so if you really see, they have already started designing new public key crypto systems and coming out of the old public key crypto systems based on factorization and related things. So the point is that the cryptography developed a lot, computation developed a lot, and with the understanding of quantum computation, uh, this is becoming a very complicated scenario. This might, there might be a, this, this whole quantum computing paradigm might be a game changer uh, very, very soon. So all the governments, like if you see the budget of government of India that was announced last year, 2020, Indian government has announced a spending of 8,000 crores uh, for the next five years in quantum computation. Uh, so, so the, the different, there is some difference between announcement and implementation uh, in, in any political system. That's fine. But people are very serious about these kinds of technologies. So this is the scenario in the technological front. And now uh, those who are listening this, maybe out of you, one or two will actually finally go to research or something related work in the domain of computation or cryptology. So for those, Mm, you have several, several, what I would say, several areas to choose. First thing is you need to know very good programming, either in C programming language or in Java or in C++ or in Python. You need to write very good programs for learning cryptology. You need to learn mathematics very well. What mathematics? Not very complicated mathematics. So most of you, if you go back a little bit, you will find that you have never read your 10 plus 2 mathematics textbooks carefully. So the NCERT mathematics textbooks are available in web page for class 11 and 12. Just finish those textbooks completely. So with these two backgrounds, you can really work for any, any cryptographic problem generally, which are used in market. For advanced research in, in this, those are in mathematics or physics or computer science. They have to go through some gate or some jam kind of exam and join some good Indian institutes because the private engineering colleges, generally they have, all of us, we know that the private engineering colleges, we do not have many good teachers also there. So you need to join very good government organizations and keep in touch with us if you require any guidance regarding that uh, when, while you like to join any government academic institute. And again, the requirement we have in this domain is you need to write down very good programs and you need to know 10 plus 2 mathematics very well. So this is all I, I like to add. If you have any question, feel free to ask now. Any question? I, I don't think there will be any question actually. So good. So I, I think I conclude the talk here. Yes, Jantu. Uh, um, uh, should we stop this session here or? Uh, yes, yes. So if there is no other some, question, this is quite I interesting. Think... If you give some more uh, no, 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 examples, no. this is fine because I'm um, think... not very interesting for me because I, I'm I'm very bad in online talks because there is no response <laughs> from other side mostly. So I think I, I really don't have many more things to add. Uh, so if there are questions, I can answer, but. Without seeing the so, people, uh, on you, the you have side, some questions in the yeah, yeah. relevant questions, obviously. Some yeah, relevant yeah, questions, questions in this can you can ask. Right. So, I, I really do not think there is any question. So, I think the next talk is uh, Pinaks, right? Yeah. So, Pinaks, are you online? 
ওকে আই অ্যাম চেকিং আই অ্যাম চেকিং ইফ পিনাক ইজ देयर আচ্ছা আমি একবার ফোন করি আই অ্যাম কলিং আই অ্যাম কলিং আচ্ছা 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 ओके जान तो लूप सो पिनाक इज जॉइनिंग सून सो अच्छा आई थिंक आई थिंक यू कैन कंटिन्यू विद द स्टूडेंट्स विद लिटिल बिट ऑफ डिस्कशन सो एंड पिनाक इज कमिंग इन इन 5 मिनट्स अच्छा अच्छा ओके 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 थैंक यू वेरी मच ओके बाय बाय थैंक यू देन थैंक यू शुमाय बाबू फॉर योर वेरी इंप्रेसिव दिस डिलीवरीशन and hope we will uh, we will get you again in our other programs also thank you thank you very much uh uh today uh, we have our ajoy which is dr ajoy shen uh, he is behind the screen uh, ajoy uh, are you here you are hearing ajoy ajoy are you hearing हेलो अजय नॉट एंजॉय अजय आई एम अजय आई एम अजय आर यू हियर and i think uh, within 2 3 minutes our next speaker is uh, professor pinak pani pal and i think uh, within 2 3 minutes he will join um, professor pinak pani pal from indian statistical institute and it's our um, this session we are entering the session for big data actually uh the and pinakmani babu from indian statistical institute will be followed by mr kushal shen from microsoft india and pinakmani babu did you join Ah yes I joined. Okay okay. So now I may introduce you Professor Pinak Pani Pal from Indian Statistical Institute and Professor Pal is associated as expert and advisor of many government institutions and IT companies like Reserve Bank of India, National Sample Survey Organization, West Bengal Infrastructural Development Corporation, TCS, etc etc. So now we are eager to hear from Professor Pal, and probably for a he has some very busy schedule today, probably a brief session. Then that session will be followed by Mr. Kushal Shen from Microsoft. Okay, Professor Pal. So uh, I think uh, all of you are students, or is any faculty present here i am gitanjali ghosh faculty sri shikshatan college present here okay good morning good morning and sir. good morning students see this uh, should be an interactive one right so we have uh, someone from the company who definitely has vast experience so if it is not interactive then uh most surely we are wasting his time too so first of all i want to know uh what is your idea about big data 
so i expect everyone should uh, give some idea what do you understand by big data yes students you have to unmute and talk a large amount of data large amount of data how large uh petabytes or in that order like we have to use some kind of online storage to access those datas that means without online storage uh, if the data is stored in your laptop or somewhere else uh, you are not doing big data so a cr crunching and accumulation of huge amounts of da data uh, uh, let's shomit finish then i'll come back to you then yes shomit Yeah, that may be a data, but uh, that may not be a sort of big data. Okay, so according to your idea, if the data is not online, then it's not a big data, right? Ah, uh, sort of. Okay, fine. Devjit, you are saying something? So, sir, I was saying the crunching and accumulation of huge amounts of data. The so same question. Ah. So, how huge and why the, uh, it is so huge is very big see when uh, i was a research scholar we had a machine you would laugh most probably the we have some machines in our institute in your statistical institute uh, the hard disk size was 20 mb and the ram size was 512 kilobyte oh Yes. yes, sir. Uh, maybe we need to super computers or such things uh, to store such data. Maybe. So, so that no means. Idea, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, you don't have any idea. Definitely, Kushal will give you a basic idea. Then you will be understanding what it is. But uh, before that, actually, I want to know what is your idea. So you think big means it should be extremely big, right? and if it is super computer then how many company can afford in working uh, big data a yeah, very very few sir yes and if it is very few then why you people are suddenly interested in big data because if it is few companies there will be few jobs right yeah sure sir yeah okay let's see what others say yes please everyone at least two has spoken what about the rest of the students yeah i think there are a lot of students so be interested large amount of data yes large amount of data then okay so everybody thinks big data is large amount of data so where is the difference in having small data or large amount of data most probably nowadays you you have a, a laptop or a desktop in your home which supports uh, at least 1 gb or 2 gb ram right am i right sir with more data sir uh, with more data comes more accuracy sir. like you can analyze more, more data more sir, with more data comes accuracy sir i mean uh, uh, why uh, we uh, sir while we are analyzing the data sir, like why we are analyzing the data comes accuracy okay so uh, we may require more data when uh, uh is it always accuracy comes sir if they are related i mean interrelated so i think they may if they are interrelated so uh again i mean i mean the whole i think the whole point is to find some uh, correlation among them so like okay so if the whole point is finding correlation then why you are insisting on the term big data so so like so we can be sure about the i mean the relation among them so what is what will be the measure that okay if we have this amount of data it's a big data and our calculations will be safe or accurate 
sir it might be uh, sir it might be just an estimate sir I... estimate okay and accurate means what means is it uh, epsilon is very small maybe 10 to the power 20 minus 20 or something like that uh, sir uh, sir uh, like yes sir hmm? sir i mean sir oh. yes sir for very small epsilon the error should be uh, sufficiently small sir so can we store very small epsilon in general programming languages say c do you uh, know some at least some programming language uh, yes sir everyone all the students yes sir yes sir uh, by the way uh, you are your background is sir math, uh, sir mathematics second year mathematics second year and others sir so, uh, math science science mostly math yes sir okay so that's good now if you have done some uh, programming so can we go for any small value of epsilon in the like in whatever language uh, you do write the code so like uh, zero is always the lowest limit but uh, sir uh, after zero there is a gap so like uh, there is a certain range sir we can achieve like there is certain range like so like for uh, byte short int long we have uh, different ranges specified for yes but it means zero is the lowest range is for the integer right Yes, sir, like 0, 0. 0.00 or sir. 0. 0.0. Can you store 0. 0.0? Yes, sir. In the, sir, like uh, I am acquainted with Java, sir. We did it in school. So uh, in double double or float data types, we had to store uh, 0. 0.0. Like. So what type of format does it use? So format. As okay. Well. Yeah. The, these things, these are few things you have to understand also. It's, it's not only the terminology, you have to understand some other basic, right? So I think uh, Kushal has joined. Kushal is our ex-student. He did his MTEC uh, CS from Indian Statistical Institute and long back. And then he joined Microsoft. And currently he is uh, working there and designs high scalable systems specifically on customer voice feedback. That's a very specific area in company or in research. You have to work in a specific area if you are going to dig very deep. So he'll be covering this big data, uh, giving a general idea and definitely uh, the working principles and some latest uh, things happening so that you can get an idea that what big data is and what uh, are the challenges and maybe uh, how you can contribute with your background. Okay. So Kushal. Kushal, are you there? It's probably uh, Kushal yeah. has joined. Yeah, I think um, uh, there was... Uh, uh, and <laughs> nice thing is... Sorry, interrupting for one second. Uh, Nice thing is uh, Professor Pal has already introduced Mr. Kushal Shen on behalf of me. So I just welcome Mr. Shen in this session. And thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pal, yes. for joining here. Uh, Please okay. continue. Yeah. So, uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kushal. So, uh, as a uh, uh, Pinatha said already that I am working in uh, Dynamics uh, 365, which is basically a business wing of Microsoft. Uh, so uh, my job there is uh, typically dealing with uh, survey data analytics. So basically the feedback forms that uh, customer submits, uh, I run analytics tool on that. Um, and uh, the kind of volume that we expect per customer per month is around 5 million responses. So we kind of run uh, uh, monthly aggregates, uh, and uh, and so basically, if we think of the size of the data, why I'm saying is that uh, the size of the data is very important here. 
and uh, we'll talk about the different aspects of uh, actually running a big data system and and what it is and what it is not as well um so there what we do is uh, we have to run uh, this analytics uh, on 5 million responses in month, right and um, say we, we go with a, a typical approach say we are dealing with something like uh, clustering okay say uh, we want to classify the data in a various categories where say we try to detect emerging trends or, or like what are people basically interested in for a particular customer for a particular feedback uh, what are the highlights i mean say uh, let's take an example a very very say we are asking for feedback for a uh, restaurant or 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 uh, basically a hotel or something like that so different uh, we would be getting different data now the data does it have to be clean that is one problem that because you are just submitting natural so the data doesn't necessarily have to be clean uh people can input all kinds of variety in it right and uh, what we uh, do over there as part of uh, uh, this is that we have to find out what are the specific categories because uh, when you are getting 5 million responses is not possible for you to individually uh, go through each response to find out the trend or find out the sentiment of the data uh, so uh, so this is where i think uh, we we have to i mean we get the challenge of handling huge amount of data so uh, so from here i would like to just go into the system i'll i'll talk a few things about big data i'll present my screen um, and i'll share the deck with you uh, so where we will be talking about what exactly constitutes of big data when we call a problem a big data problem and if big data is a solution to all problems in the world okay on uh, so just let me see camera and okay uh so if any one of you have any question um, uh, during the session feel free to ask okay uh, so we'll keep it interactive uh, so so uh, first sorry, thing sorry can, uh, can i interrupt for one second yeah, yeah. uh this uh, uh, question answer session can be continued with uh, your session probably because we have some yes. time we may have some time extra so Mm -hmm. after your lecture uh, that question answer session may be continued no problem okay sure okay so uh, okay so first thing is that uh, uh, is that what constitutes of big data and what exactly is big data so uh, when when we hear the term big data we would typically start assuming that the i mean Uh, we would start assuming that uh, when we are calling it as a big data, it has to be very high volume or something. Well, volume is definitely one of the parameters, but how much volume? Okay, is it one GB, one TB, one PB, one AB, or one uh, Z uh, zettabyte? Uh, well, it all depends on where you are sending today. Okay. so uh, if we if we take uh, something like in a uh, time from the past we would definitely see that uh, i mean our rams were much lesser i mean today the mobile phone has got uh, 8 gb of uh, main memory i mean that was a luxury i mean it was not there uh, even even few years back right uh, so so uh, it all depends what is big data to you today it all depends how far we are progressing from um, i mean in terms of capability so the essential crux of the problem is that how much data you have and how fast can you derive information right i mean uh, a, a given a slow machine also you can you can derive some information out of a huge amount of data probably it will take 100 years right and it won't make sense right you won't be waiting 100 years for something 
as say, as say in my example as saying that we aggregate on the, so we show the analytics based on uh, the monthly aggregate now every month if i want to see data i mean the worst case uh, by information is valid for one month i mean the slowest system that i can use to process is something that will take something less than one month uh, not more than that so uh, this is where uh, uh, we have to consider uh, that uh, just one second okay so this is where uh, it is important to understand where you're standing now if you see the volume of uh, if you see the volume of data uh, the kind of data that is generated today so what we consider is that the generated data whatever data is present today uh, 90% of data is actually uh, generated within the last uh, two years uh, this is this is how the data is growing exponentially if i can show you a graph of uh, data generation maybe um, let's see if we can see something like this so uh, this actually needs some subscription or uh, to fill up some information but uh, i think I, if you can actually uh, see the graph from here uh, i hope my screen is visible right so if you can see the graph from here which is not completely visible i have to like uh, remove this uh, thing for but if you see the graph is basically an exponentially growing graph uh, that we see that is over the year the data the, the amount of generated data is actually exponentially growing and this is where this whatever however we define big data it's always going to be outdated because uh, i mean today we generate around 40 to 50 zettabytes of data every year okay so and and what generates that data everything around you generates that data okay uh, say for example, you want uh, driverless cars. Uh, it's the amount. It is generating huge amount of data. Uh, IoT devices at your home, okay? Uh, IoT devices, something like a uh, very simple device, something like say you do not stay at your home for a very long period of time, and you uh, plug in something like an uh, automated watering system for your plants, okay? It's a very small system where you have some moisture sensor and then that is fed into the IoT cloud. And then based on that, uh, you just turn on a water pump. Okay, as simple as that. So uh, the setup is pretty simple. I think it will not cost you more than 500 rupees to create your own setup. But if you see the potential of this, so that is also, so every time, every time you're polling, right? So every, every minute or so, uh, this frequency is also configurable. Every minute or so, you are generating some data that this is the moisture level, this is the moisture level. So that data is constantly getting fed somewhere. So imagine like everyone in the world starts using something like this. Uh, the um, huge amount of data that needs to be there. Okay, now what is the challenge? You're getting a huge amount of data. Okay, from here you're getting a huge amount of data. But Obviously, the biggest problem that you are going to face now is you need to process that instantly. Okay, you need to process that instantly. So you want to say that okay, uh, the uh, my plant has got dried up and I'm going to water it tomorrow. I mean, after I mean, I mean that time is also not predictable when you are saying that. Okay, whenever my data will get processed, I will get to know that uh, there is a problem and I will start watering the plants. That is not going to work. So uh, you get the second V over here, which is basically the velocity, right? So basically, so if you see big data, it's not just uh, uh, volume of data, okay? It also consists of the velocity of data. That is how fast is your data incoming, how fast you need to process, how fast do you need to analyze and uh, provide the analytics based on this, okay? And uh, so, so uh, this is uh, another V, basically. Okay, it consists of actually multiple Vs. Uh, okay, and then then there is variety. Okay, 
uh, what is a variety okay uh, variety is basically see uh, when you are dealing with such data uh, so so uh, data typically can be categorized into uh, three uh, broad classifications one is uh, uh, structured unstructured and semi structured data so uh, when you are like feeding in from a huge like uh, so many diverse sources um, then what happens is that a lot of variety goes into your data right so you are not dealing with a single type of data like traditional um, um, traditional systems are typically good at dealing with a single type of structured data so say if you have a, a sql server or something um, very similar relational database uh, so so uh, most of you understand what a relational database is right so uh, okay so uh, so so basically a relational database so where where we typically expect a very structured because you got to have defined schemas right so uh, the structures are uh, very much defined uh, but uh, big data systems uh, with with this uh, kind of huge influx of data uh we start getting a lot of uh, variety in the data that means some of the data may be structured some unstructured uh, when when we are saying the unstructured data it can be in the form of uh, say uh, integer values text multiple languages so uh, eventually uh, eventually the problem is that uh, your data is not in a very clean format okay uh, what advantages do we have in a clean format clean format say for example uh, if i create a relational database uh, and say if i only have structured data and say if i have something like a, a rating question or something say how much you would rate something or something you basically aggregations are typically easier okay uh, even with your sql so when i'm saying aggregations uh, what i mean is uh, operations such as say uh even like operations such as greater than average uh, all this kind of things okay so whether you want to get the minimum uh, possible value from the set or you want to get the mean or something like that because uh, these will give you a lot of insights okay i mean a, a simple term such as mean uh, uh, that is the average will give a lot of insights right um a very good example of uh, um, such kind of analytics is uh, say say um, say you want to i mean uh, this was typically a uh, uh, example which was used earlier uh, that was uh, of constructing uh, um, oil pumps okay that is a petrol station i mean i mean this can change to uh, your uh, electric recharge points as well with with time progress we are get see more and more electric vehicles in the picture right so uh, what happens over there is that um, see see i want to set up a electric vehicle station uh, recharge point recharging station uh, what i will do is i will typically see start calculating the uh amount or 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 start tracking the amount of electric vehicles passing through that um area that portion of the road and what happens is that when when i uh, start getting such uh, when i start getting such insights and i can i can process uh, this um, that information um that okay this is the volume of uh, cars uh, that i am getting every day and so uh, and so uh, the, i mean uh, if i consider that 10% of it will be my customer or something uh, i will have a very uh, sustainable way of maintaining uh, the station so i can i can set up and then if obviously it is not sufficient i'll simply uh, discard it so these three uh, term these three v's are very important i mean uh volume velocity and variety are very important in terms of whether whether you are going to consider your system as a big data system or not so velocity is like how fast you need to deal with that data volume is how i mean even if the volume is today 1 gb say which is practically very small in today so 
uh, if it's like exponentially growing you know that this is potential for a, a big data system this is a potential candidate uh, because of the exponential growth of volume and so is a variety okay other than this three these three are the major ones uh, you still have uh, so what i'll do is i'll just uh, write it here you have more uh, put up a whiteboard So uh, what you have uh, over here is basically you still have this one second. Can I write something? Okay. So other than this, you also have something like velocity. Okay. Uh, that is uh, the quality of data. Okay. So uh, I mean. Uh, so when when we say uh, quality of data, that means uh, uh, whether whether the source data is clean or not, whether the source data is correct or not. Okay. So um, um, and say for example, if we have too much of noise, okay, and and and, and it's it's so much noise that uh, we cannot even differentiate between noise and uh, the data. I mean, then uh, your analytics will obviously fail. I mean, because uh, if you if you want to draw a graph on top of something that uh, probably the mean line that you are going to draw is going to go anywhere. So we won't get any tangible information um, out of it, and which gives another view that whether I mean you would actually go with this or not, depending on whether you get value out of it or not. So, so as I said, like other than the three Vs that we already talked about, which was volume, velocity, and variety, you have a few more. That is velocity, value. Also, there is another important aspect of it, that is visualization. Okay. Uh, visualization is not exactly a criteria uh, uh, for this kind of, uh, I mean, using a big data system, uh, but it is to add value to it. Okay. So in today's world, you also need to, I mean, uh, not everyone is going to understand what a big data system is, right? But uh, but if you see the potential, I mean, uh, the customers, I would say, or, or, or if you want to... Uh, uh, say in terms of your clients, whoever is going to consume the information that you help derive from the amount of the huge amount of data, they need some kind of easy way to visualize it. They need to feel that okay, the data. Okay, what is the data? Say uh, a typical example, like even if you, if I tell you all the numbers of the data, the data year by year. Uh, I mean, uh, just by hearing out, you do not tend to remember, right? That what was the data um, in 2010 versus what is the data in 2020, and you typically fail to compare it. Okay, uh, That is where the visualization helps. Uh, visualization gives you a very easy way, a very easy tool to actually understand this comparative study. That, okay, what, what was there and what is going to come next? And basically, I mean, it gives you a very powerful analytical tool. And I think, I think, uh, if you see Power BI as a platform has become very popular uh, because uh, it can deal with uh, visualization of, uh, but structured data. Okay. So, so, uh, so basically, uh, these are the kind of very basic pillars uh, when you are talking about uh, any any kind of uh, big data uh, system. Okay, uh, now, uh, why big data? What What is big data? Why, why did this term uh, come into picture? And when when did it come? Um, so uh, basically, uh, this concept uh, came from one of uh, uh, Google's white paper, uh, where they uh, wanted to deal with uh, this uh, uh, big uh, kind of volume of data. And, uh, and they devised basically the uh, kind of, they had a white paper which uh, was basically, uh, I mean, the map to reduce system that you have is basically nothing but uh, an implementation of that. 
um so uh, so if you see the idea is just to get meaning out of data okay the target is just to get meaning out of data nothing else okay you just want some you just want to have a high, huge influx of data you want to process and you just want to get some meaning out of it that that's the thing now do you need a big data system so not always because uh, big data is not your uh, go to word for everything okay it is definitely not one theory for solving all the problems in the world okay i mean um, I mean, there are different ways to solve different problems. Uh, so, so uh, typically, typically a big data system relies on uh, the map reducing uh, potential of the data. That is, you need to be able to parallelly process uh, the amount of data that you have. Okay, this is a very basic requirement of choosing a big data system. I mean, uh, if you cannot parallelly process the entire uh, set and you cannot break it down into parallel uh, I mean, chunks of uh, data where you actually deal with it in uh, parallel, uh, probably you won't be able to uh, take any benefit uh, out of a, a big data system. So it is definitely not a uh, system where everyone needs to jump onto it. Okay. Uh, now, uh, okay. So now, now, now I think, I think uh, the first uh, uh, the first concept uh, that we learned over here is where, what are the things that I will need to take a look at before even considering big data, okay? Before even considering a big data system. So uh, volume, uh, velocity uh, is uh, another factor. So volume, velocity, variety, veracity, value, so when all of these are, uh, I, I would see all of these are deriving value. So basically, uh, then I would probably uh, take a look at any uh, system which will, I, I mean, a big data system. Okay. Uh, now, now, okay. So this is another example, basically, where uh, saying that. Uh, this is a hard disk which is filled with uh, movies and uh, do I have big data? Okay, first of all, it doesn't matter, right? If you have a hard disk full of uh, movies, for TV or movies, you really do not care if it's big data or not. I mean, how much data you have, if you're just going to watch movies from that hard disk, you really don't care. I mean, what, what big data system do you require there? Nothing, right? You just need to open a file, play it. You need some thing to decode uh, the uh, decode it, and just show you the visuals. That's it. I mean, you, you don't need big data systems to uh, watch movies, right? When is this useful? Okay, so when do you consider something like a when when you do want to introduce a big data? Say, for example, uh, you have. Netflix and Amazon Prime and the other OTT platforms that is coming up today, right? Uh, now, uh, what happens is that uh, when you are dealing with such systems, you typically analyze user feedback. Okay, so if you see uh, this, this portion is very important to understand that what we are trying to do over with the data, with the data. So what we are going to do is so Netflix to increase its uh, monthly active usage. So basically, and daily active use is something like that. So down and now, um, uh, so what they would do is they would try to show you movies or genres of movies which you would be interested in, right? I mean, if someone is uh, interested in a love story, showing them a, a story which is basically from action, uh, may not uh, be interesting to them and and they may skip right and they, because they're not interested in seeing that movie now uh, what are they interested in so users can typically i mean the, the data which movie which kind of uh, which genre of movie the user is interested in you can pick this up from the user interaction whether i mean the user interaction can be in terms of likes that you submit right whether you like the movie or you rate a movie say out of five you read some movie or 
whether you have watched it multiple times or you have watched the complete movie or something like that so these are measures of whether you were interested in that movie or not now this is one portion of the data just half of the data what kind of movies you like now it will need to suggest you movies which you may like that is movies which you have not watched it will it will try to do it will try to give you some suggestions so this is nothing but a recommender system okay now to recommend you movies say for example if you ask your friend that okay i like i have i mean i have seen these is movies out of this i like say this one this one this one can you please suggest me some more okay so what would your friend do your friend would actually give you a few more and if he there's a movie buff or something he will uh, take a look at a lot of movies and he watches a lot of movies regularly he understands what happens or what not in the movies he'll be able to recommend you a few movies where uh, i mean where he would say see these are the movies you like i think you'll like these because these have a similar taste how did he know that they were of similar taste that that's the challenging point because he watched the movie and from the frames right it's not in the name right always that uh, you'd be getting name is definitely one of the uh, features uh, but not everything is not in the name right so from watching the movies from some, uh, watching certain sequence he was able to determine the similarity between the movies you liked and those movies and hence recommended you such things now with such a huge number of movies it is not possible for one person to take a look right at all the movies that you may want to see so what happens is that so so uh, this is basically a way of uh, sequentially accessing the data where one person need to watch all the movies and then give you a recommendation this will definitely work but it's not scalable that's the problem it's not scalable so you don't get a solution out of it right if you have say uh, to watch say 5000 movies your friend is going to say no you better find out your own movies i cannot okay uh, but suppose you have 1000 um, team of 1000 people and then uh, you ask each one of them to watch five movies okay so if you see if you see what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to draw the analogy between the requirement of a big data system or system how it works the working principle of it uh, so what it will do is it will divide those movies say say five movies we start watching five movies each thousands of people and and see we have certain defined categories that whether it's a love story action comedy or what kind of movie it is uh, so each each of these thousand people each one of them can parallelly pick up five movies and then categorize them okay once they are categorized there can be someone who collates it okay uh, what do i mean by that so basically say say uh, you are looking for action genre what he will do he will simply say those who don't have not found any um, action films in the list just yeah, step aside those who have found please uh, take a step forward and this then basically what they can easily do is that with a reduced set so basically what you did is you were able to somehow uh, distribute it parallelly and then reduce the number of candidates okay uh, obviously i mean uh, these kind of systems i mean uh, if you if you're looking for recommendation or something uh, like that are not 100% accurate right the it may give you a suggestion where a movie is not of action genre it may also skip a movie which was actually a action genre and uh, we always keep some margin for uh, such errors okay uh, now what happens is that uh, you were able to distribute this load parallelly and when uh, all of these people came uh, came in together okay and uh, what did this they basically uh, try to uh, map their data now okay so basically this is where they are saying that okay i found two action movies someone is saying i did not someone is saying i found one now what will they do they'll push all the movies together okay now once then then basically you have a shorter list of action movies say out of 5000 only 100 movies are action movies okay now all these 100 movies can be recommended to you 
that okay these are action movies you can watch them at your convenience okay so a map reduce system works in a very uh, similar fashion okay so i'll i'll go into the uh, uh details of it a bit uh, details of it but uh, the overall idea is basically that you had distributed this 5000 movies among 1000 uh, members and then each on of dm have actually found out okay these is two are action this one is a comedy or something like that and then you basically try to reduce so basically what you do is you say okay those who have the name of the comedy movies keep them in box 1 uh, name of the action movie keep them in box 2 uh, name of the uh, say uh, uh, something like uh, the drama sequence or something keep in box 3 what you are doing is see you distributed this 5000 movies and within very much less amount of time say uh, watching five movies say say one person can watch it in two days or something like that so within two days you could actually uh, uh, divide these into broad categories right like action uh, comedy or something like that and you have the list in boxes now so anybody can now come to you okay and ask you i want to see comedy movies you can just take hold of the box where you have the list of comedy movies and give them a suggestion or or you can just simply uh, now now because people are already watching others are watching so you also have rating or something like that you can recommend top 10 movies out of that list because you just have to find out the top 10 among the reduced set okay so this entire idea of distributing and using parallelization to achieve something is the concept of this map reduction okay so uh, this is this is how you would actually approach any problem if you have to do deal with it doesn't have to i mean this not necessarily has to go with a map reduction or a big data system any kind of and depending on the data what you have you can choose i mean from a lot of variety of system from map reduce and uh, big data systems are uh, one typical category of uh, this system okay so uh, did, did you have i mean anyone has any doubt till now i mean did you understand how did we uh, solve this problem and what did we achieve so if you see if one person had to watch the entire film she would have taken i mean with this assumption of 2.5 movies per day uh, so he would have taken uh, i think how many 2000 days right to watch 5000 uh, movies uh, and we reduced the problem to two days yes Uh, did I hear the question, someone? No. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, uh, th- this is essentially the working principle behind. Like, when, why would we even um, use? Why would you even uh, use a big data system, or, or what you are trying to achieve? How how are you going to solve the problem? So, uh, if you see uh, this uh, picture is taken from. Glen Lockwood uh, dot com. Uh, so, uh, if you see uh, the picture over here, uh, I mean, these data are basically your set of movies over here, uh, and these processes are nothing but um, the individuals who actually watch the movie and process the data out of it. Okay. So, uh, uh, what? So, I mean, uh, so what we did over here is. uh we uh, bring the data to the uh, and so basically we bind the compute and the data together over here okay because if you see all of the nodes so when i'm saying nodes i mean uh, individual processing processing capability individual machines or something uh so that's basically what i'm calling as nodes so what they did is basically they were able to uh they were able to divide this data among them okay and then come out with a solution i mean so e- each individual is working parallelly okay so basically they were going to come out with a solution where each one of them were able to uh, sort and then reduce the data so the first principle is you should be able to divide your data this is the first thing that you need, need to be able to do okay with this parallelism that this person so here if you see the traditional parallelism mechanism Uh, what it is doing is it is basically there's one consumer of the data 
who is going to uh, basically distribute the load okay then uh, distribute the load but if you if you see uh, the map reduction system the process and the data are bound together so each one can individually independently work then doesn't need to be a driver okay uh, there there's no need of someone telling that you need to do this they all are, are equal they can all basically uh, work together yeah someone needs to be the driver to collate it at the end uh, but so individually they can all deliver their purpose right that is categorized say in case of this example of movie they were able to categorize uh, the i mean the movies into different classes okay so uh, this is a very uh, new example of how basically this this is basically the big file uh, that was there and these are definitely uh, blocks of data block 1 block 2 block 3 block 4 block 5 and block 6 say, say for example i mean doesn't really matter i mean which uh, how you divide this into blocks uh, so uh, this is something like uh, say for example you are processing one so uh, what we saw is like different people are watching different movies now with so huge number of frames uh, that is also i mean that also needs to be scaled right and we can do that as well so now 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 let's zoom in a bit okay so what we are seeing that one person is watching five movies now say for example we need even a faster system a faster system what we can do is one person starts watching one movie and he creates a team of five and basically all of them starts watching one movie okay so what you are doing is you are basically scaling how are you scaling this is known as horizontal scaling okay so uh, so uh, there are two broad categories of scaling basically one is horizontal scaling the other is vertical scaling okay so what is vertical scaling where you increase the potential of a single node okay from the movie example if we see someone who is a very avid watcher of movies and like have watched a lot of nolan movies and shotojit ray movies and typically understands a very critical watcher uh so basically is a very good film critic or something they can take a single look at the film and determine what is where okay so basically what you are doing is you are increasing the capability of a single node you are bringing in more costly node because this person is going to be costly because he is an expert in movies movie watching right and what is horizontal scaling you do not need to increase the expertise okay you still have same same level of expertise but what you have is more number of people you can just simply say add more number of people okay horizontal scaling and vertical scaling has their own set of advantages one is when we are dealing with uh, traditional uh, relational database or something like that where there is a lot of joins and uh, join operations involved or something like that we would choose the vertical uh, system because we want all the information to reside on a single node okay uh, but um if if you if you are uh, take a look at modern systems uh, horizontal scalable systems are much preferred okay why why is that much preferred because uh, you can simply so better see any kind of these systems uh, whenever you are designing any system uh, there's always a machine itself it's your the time always at your it's your फ्रॉम अ सिंगल नोट प्रोसेसिंग ओके what we can do is say we now divide this load of five from into five individuals okay say even we need to scale even faster you have to go one step beyond this what we do is we divide the movie into different chunks okay that is different sequence so say first 30 minutes next 30 minutes then 30 minutes say a two hour movie into four chunks and then we ask individuals to uh, watch that chunk and decide whether what category can it belong to okay so so basically what we are doing is we are achieving so if you see if we actually divide all the movies into 30 minutes chunk 
and actually go to something a parallelization of this level uh the entire recommendation systems analysis can be performed in just 30 minutes okay so why why uh, our i mean what is one quick advantage good advantage of horizontal scalable system uh it's that you do not need to keep paying a lot of money i mean resource is always costly right whenever uh if you if you if you're working in any industry uh you'll be knowing that resource is very costly i mean every single operation that you do every single second that you spend every single minute that you spend you're paying money and then you need to sell it to your customers so the more money you pay while creating it the more money you have to ask from the customers now we all understand this problem right we need to make profit and our customers also need to make profit and that's difficult that's a very difficult problem how do the producer and consumer both make profit out of the same thing that's a very difficult problem so that is where cost optimizations are important and and horizontal scaling is an excellent thing for cost optimization so uh, it will actually help you bring in nodes right like freelancers uh, that okay i need to analyze movie for 30 minutes so please bring in 2000 uh, extra people to do it i am done now i don't need those 2000 extra people so so i i don't need to uh, keep keep them uh, i don't need to keep paying them something like this so uh, this is where uh, we achieve horizontal scaling okay so if you see this example this is an example where a big file is broken down into blocks and then you have data node 1 data node 2 3 4 so these are like blocks randomly assigned uh, this assignment is random and uh, redundancy is uh, there so that we have a fail safe environment i mean uh, because uh, fail safety is important uh, you cannot say simply say that okay one of my node went down and um, and i cannot process it so uh, redundancy is there because of the uh, fail safe system okay now the next example what we'll see is exactly what we uh, discussed in the um, problem with the movies right so basically uh, this is where we had to uh, count the number of uh, fruits basically okay so we had to count the number of fruits uh, i mean or, or the number of times each word is occurring over here and uh, and this original input list is a very huge list okay it's a very uh, huge list. i mean it can be zeta bytes of data okay you really don't care it can be zeta bytes of data and that that is where uh, big data systems or parallelization systems come into picture okay so what you would be doing is simply see the first thing is that we randomly allocate okay so first line we assign to node one second node two third node three something like this so basically we have a so the, the first step is basically splitting the data that is we were able to split the data and then uh, basically mapping is where we assign so if you see we create this uh, key value pair so uh, uh, this this basically we do with the help of a, any mapper class or something so uh, if you are conversant with uh, java or python or something like that even, even java has a mapper class where you can um uh, implement your own map reduce system you can extend uh, that class and uh, work up with it so basically what is happening is uh, you have the counts along with the fruit okay so we are simply doing nothing but just uh, having the count and then uh, the next is basically the shuffle and sort the portion where you actually started dropping uh, the movies in the boxes right so basically that's the portion uh, which is parallel to this where basically if you see the shuffle and sort is doing nothing but uh, they are being grouped together using the keys so they are all grouped together so what they are doing is okay i have one apple i put it in the first box someone from um, uh, the third person is saying i also have one apple i put it in first box so something like this so basically now the boxes are labeled okay so boxes are labeled as like uh, first box is apple second box is orange third box is guava fourth plum something like this and it goes on 
then what happens is that you have the reduction system which is basically the aggregator system reduction is basically that reduces nothing but the aggregator system where basically you have the aggregates now i mean then the final output is you already have the count now what can be your query you can simply ask the system that how many oranges i have and it will be able to tell you that you have three oranges okay while the data was unstructured in the original input oranges are split across the entire document say some zero byte document it is very difficult for you to if you have to sequentially uh, process it it's very difficult i mean you have to go through the entire so if you do something like a linear search you know how what's the complexity of that right to go through all the words in the system i mean you can do that no problem with this obviously you will get the correct answer as well but what are you gaining over here you're gaining efficiency you're gaining your uh, gaining on time that this is the advantage of uh, such a system so you're basically gaining a lot on the time so uh, and and this is i think mean, this is where uh, any kind of highly scalable systems or or a uh, big data system come into picture okay. now uh, so yeah so uh, where can you use it everywhere okay but obviously you need to determine whether you are going to use it or not i mean as i said already mentioned it's not a theory of everything it is definitely not a solution to everything possible uh it when it came into picture it was one of the uh, most popular buzzword and uh, i'm i mean we all of us would be inclined to uh, try our hands out at uh, such a problem right it's very interesting right i mean uh, designing highly scalable system itself is a very interesting challenge and when you have a new paradigm uh, coming up it's very important that you try it out and uh, and, and basically you see what happens uh, much like uh, microservice architecture and any any technology that comes uh, when, whenever it comes but as with most things uh, you can use it okay based on the criteria that i have already mentioned whether you can achieve parallelization of the data whether uh, you can uh, whether it actually confines to uh, the fields uh, that we discussed uh, it can be used everywhere okay whether you choose to use it or not will depend on your expertise or your understanding of the data itself okay whether you need it or not I and mean, not every problem will need a big data solution okay even with huge amounts of data uh, okay so huge amount of data is not big data that is one uh, thing you need always need to uh, remember okay and uh, basically uh, so uh, this will give, this is going to give you an idea of like how how big data systems are i mean why it got introduced how and where Uh, it is in place, and what kind of problem you can use to solve it? Okay, now uh, basically I have uh, so basically these are a few examples of where uh, picture is uh, basically it is used by everyone, right? Um, I mean because uh, ev everyone is going to have a huge amount of data. I mean, you see, uh, uh, imagine a very simple thing like a, 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 a spark. some filter or or any machine learning is so a machine learning uh, problems with always need a huge amount of data right to train itself um, so so even even for those kind of things where you need to define the pattern right so even so for machine learning what you do you basically recognize a repetition in the pattern that is what machine learning is all about um, so uh, for that also i think uh, to to get hold of the pattern because you, because you're seeing a very huge amount of data a huge influx of data it's difficult to get hold of the pattern right so so that is where uh, uh, you you want a big data system come in place i'll give you an example where big data system will not be useful also okay see uh, i am uh, see, see i want to analyze uh, individual sentiments of the uh, twitter feed okay uh, individual sentiments of twitter feed now if you see individual when we are talking about individual sentiments say for example uh, 
we don't need the entire data at one because uh, if if the, if it's say a serial flow of data say see for example i mean where we do not need the entire data right if there is a serial flow sequential flow of data we can individually stamp those uh, sentiment because the model is already there okay the model is already up we know what sentiment it is generate so we are not thinking the context of that feed right the twitter feed is independent of the other tweets that is coming in okay so that is where you do need the entire set of data you are dealing with one right? so you are dealing with a basically kind of a transaction system where uh, you are getting one input and then uh, you are basically stamping it with some value and then you are letting it go you don't need to need to remember but at the same point of time say you want to find out say for example uh, you want to find out the correlation between two uh, tweets say for example you need a lot of data for that i mean probably a big data system might be useful over there when you are trying to find the correlation between uh, people say for example something like this right where uh, um, say a, a person who is uh, tweeting about new cars are probably also tweeting about the hike in petrol price okay so something like that where you are trying to define correlation between two kinds of uh, two different data points uh these are systems where you need the context information you need more data right you cannot just simply work with a single data point and then stamp it with some value and then let it go you need this uh system to be in place okay so i have listed a few things which uh, would be very fundamental to uh, actually uh, learn big data okay so uh, python java uh, is another language uh, you if you know any one of the it's absolutely fine um, i mean uh, the programming language is really not really a very big concern uh, if you know some programming language you can always pick up the rest very fast uh, data structure algorithm fundamentals of the operating systems are very important okay um, because uh, if you if you see eventually how we store data how we structure data how how are we storing the data what is the algorithm because if you see the uh, what we are doing is basically trying to design an efficient parallel uh, ization algorithm to solve the problem so you need to understand uh, the complexity of the algorithm you need to understand how we can actually deal with the data how we can divide the data so a uh, very fundamental idea of this structural algorithms are very much important uh, operating system knowledge is very essential you have to deal with uh, how, how the data is stored the um, hdfs basically so you have to know understand what is hdfs how the file system is handled over there um, because you are, you are you are storing huge amount of data now you have to store it in a particular format where you are able to map and reduce right and then here are a few uh, portions of the hadoop ecosystem um, hadoop is basically uh, you can you can uh, it's an open source uh, so you can basically uh, play around with it um, um uh, most i mean if you, even if you take some uh, azure or aws trial uh, you can set up a cluster and uh, just play around with it um so and here i have uh, given a few reference uh, these contain links uh, of uh, some of the uh, resources that i've used to uh, do this and uh, these are good resources you can you can always go through this resources to get a very uh, good understanding of what where to start from and what you uh, need to do in order to approach this problem of big data fine okay uh, now now uh, we can do two things uh, so uh, if you have immediate questions we can take them up uh, now or there is another way i mean if you i, I mean anyway i'll share a, a link with you where you can post your questions and i'll be able to answer you uh, but if you have immediate questions we can take them up right now. no questions okay uh thank you pinapri sir thank you jansal uh, for uh, um, this opportunity and i think i think uh, what i'll do is i'll uh, share a link with uh, sir and uh, ask him to share it with you if you have any questions you can post it there uh, regarding um, any 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 concept that or, or even if you can go through the links and read through it and if you find anything uh, if you have any questions regarding that 
you can always reach out to me over there. Okay, uh, so if we don't have any other questions, thank you everyone. Um, I'll just share the link. Um, which is the so students, you don't have any question. That seems that you have understood everything. That's good. So, uh -huh. I think, uh, uh, yes. Is there any question? If any question? Are there any question? There is any other question. So, uh, maybe we can close this session. Uh, thank you. I'll share the, the uh, link so that if you have any question later on, also you can uh, just uh, just put them. Uh, okay, then uh, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Sen, uh, uh, for your valuable talk and which reflecting your in depth knowledge in the subject. And which obviously widen and widen our knowledge base and encourage us and enrich us all. Thank you, thank you very much, and hope you to uh, get again in our another programs. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've also shared uh, the link with you. Uh, you can share it with uh, the participants, uh, and if they want, uh, they can post in their questions over there. Okay, okay, that's nice. That's nice. Uh, today, uh, okay, will it give you right now or later? No, I mean, you don't have to give it to me right now. They can post in their questions at their convenience once they, uh, I'll, I'll also share a deck with you. Uh, once they go through it once more, probably go through the links once more, they can read through it and then they can post their questions. That is also fine. Okay. Okay. Then. Um, so thank you, thank you very much. Today, uh, Ajay, our own Ajay, Ajay, Dr. Ajay Shen, Dr. Ajay Shen, he is assistant professor of mathematics in East Calcutta Girls College. He is working behind the screen, that is working as an admin to this program. So Ajay, say hello to some to us, everyone uh, participating. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, on behalf of East Calcutta Girls College, I welcome everyone to this uh, workshop organized by ISI and you know RC was Cryptological Center and Security. So in collaboration with East Calcutta Girls College, once again, I welcome everyone to this uh, workshop. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ajay. And uh, one, I have one or two things to be announced. That is uh, before our last session, last session on cyber security. And uh, before that, I want to announce we, Ajay will uh, give us a link for a feedback form will be uh, given. And you, the participant, please fill up the that form, that uh, feedback form. To get the certificate because all the all the participants who registered are not participating so we'll give uh, the certificate only those who will fill the feedback form so also Ajay will give us the feedback form uh, and please please fill that feedback form so that we can send the certificate to you and feedback form just there is your email ID, name, etc., and your reactions. So, before starting our uh, new and last session, we take a two minutes break. Let me see whether Professor Obishe Kothikari, who will be the who will be the speaker for that next session, will join or not. Two three minutes break. I think by this time he will join.
okay uh, now what are for the last session let me introduce professor ohishek odhikari uh, this session is you know on cyber security and professor ohishek odhikari from presence university professor odhikari he did his phd under supervision of professor bimu kumar rai isi who was our first speaker today and professor odhikari is a gold medalist in msc from calcutta university a recipient of young scientist award president of india gold medal and a very illustrious illustrious career in mathematics in pure mathematics then in cryptology specialized in cryptology and cyber security as a post postdoctoral fellow he visiting and visiting scientist he has visited uh in capacity of uh is it in capacity of postdoctoral fellow and visiting scientist uh and associated with different universities and academic institutions uh in different countries like japan sweden russia denmark norway etc etc so many and he is already a famous case divide five already five students already obtained phd from under him is uh, one of his book basic modern algebra with applications published by springer is quite famous so by this time you are joining i give some introduction to you okay. to, uh, to the participants already so that time so uh you have already joined i i can see you so you may start now professor udhikari okay uh so thank you very much uh for giving me an opportunity to discuss with all of you uh let me uh, just have a look at how many of you just could you please write on the chat box how many of you from the maths background or maybe how many of you from the uh stat background or engineering background in the chat box could you please write it quickly how many of you are from which background in the chat box could you please write it quickly okay so mathematics statistics i can find it okay that's good math okay depending on that i will so mostly i can see that uh, it's uh, maths maybe till now mostly anyway uh, so the title of my talk is basically application of algebra in cyber security so in this talk uh, i will basically highlight how algebra could be useful in our day to day life so when usually i was a student the, this question haunted me most like uh, abstract algebra linear algebra we studied many things but is there any such applications of all those things so in in my class in this talk i will basically try to highlight this uh, okay so let me share my screen is the screen visible is the screen visible to all of you okay can you see my screen uh, okay thank yes, you yes sir yes okay so in this talk i will basically as i mentioned i will describe how algebra could be useful uh, in our day to day life so let me start with an advertisement uh, in my web page suppose i have given this uh, i am giving back to my community due to covid 19 all bitcoin sent to my address below will be sent back double that is if you send me 1000 dollar i will send you back 2000 dollar and i have given the link for my bitcoin uh, sending process and this will be only valid for 30 minutes if somebody of you could see this kind of advertisement in my website you either think that i am joking with all of you or you may think that i become a mad during this lockdown period but 
let me explain uh, in details from another perspective so you can see that this is the verified twitter account of uh, mr barack obama who was the 44th president of united states and this is the verified twitter account of barack obama so you can see that how many persons are following him so whatever he tweets uh, within fraction of second it becomes uh, viral so in the twitter account of barack obama you can see the same message all the bitcoins except the fact that this uh, this link has been distorted a bit so you cannot see the link but all the things that i wrote in my website was exactly the same thing but it was from barack obama but not only from barack obama you can see that the same message was also reflected through the verified twitter account of bill gates uh john biden who is currently the president elon musk you know the tesla company's uh, ceo and the, the chairman so all their twitter accounts the same message where uh, same message was actually reflected now we can understand that uh, within a fraction of second because many thousands of people are following their twitter account so within fraction of second that message become viral and uh, within half an hour thousands of people they sent the money uh, to that account using this bitcoin and after few hours it has been found in july 15 it happened in july 15 so it at the beginning of this uh, whole pandemic situation so from march to maybe july july 15 2020 and within few hours it has been found uh, that it was a scam it was known as twitter bitcoin scam and it is considered to be the uh, biggest scam in in the history of twitter account and all so basically it was a scam and many people didn't understand that it was not an original message but it was a fake message it was a trap the similar kind of message also happened in case of our prime minister it was reported uh, from bbc news in september 3 2020 the similar kind of message was also reflected in the twitter account of narendra modi so you can understand that uh, what i am talking about is basically dealing with cyber security so every day we deal with many of the internet of things and internet and uh, many things and that actually requires a uh, security so security is must essential so for example nowadays most of us we buy things using some credit card or debit card or sometimes we order things using uh, the hands on delivery and etc but when we pay some money using our credit card or debit card so you can understand that uh, you are basically paying the money to the merchant through some bank so how do you communicate with this bank because you are basically giving the password otp and all uh, to the bank using your mobile or using your laptop now how will you be secure or how will you be ensured that uh, the password that you are giving or to whom you are communicating with is a correct person or is a honest guy similarly when we try to communicate with suppose you in your google uh say uh, in your google you type something for example my name and then suddenly you will find some website of mine or something else which will come at the beginning of the google uh, search engine uh, there are some algorithms to have some page rank and all so when you find that uh, then how will you be sure that okay whatever you are seeing is basically a genuine or it's not a, a website done by some fraud thing or something how will you get some kind of confidence that means when you are going to communicate with others for example the client is uh, going to communicate with a server then how the communication actually happens not only that all of us almost all of us we use whatsapp so in whatsapp you must have heard about the term end to end encryption when you talk something when you write something at the end you might sometimes you get the message that all the message are being encrypted using end to end encryption and it's not only any third party even the whatsapp will not be able to listen what is being sent or what is being communicated with each other so
so this kind of things are very common in our today's scenario and you will be surprised to know that uh, behind all this the major security is being provided by this big number not particular big this number but uh, the security is completely and most of the cases are wholly dependent on this kind of big numbers and you'll be surprised to know that this whole big number is nothing but a single prime which has 904 digits within it so if i ask you the question is it really a prime number so you will just have to check the last digit since it's not even it's odd you will not be able to say surely that okay this is a prime number it's certainly not an even number but you won't be able to say whether this is prime or not. But the question is, how did I get this prime? And you'll be surprised to know that to get this big primes, you will certainly require lots of abstract algebra and number theory. And here, the biggest achievement of this, one of the biggest achievements of this and applications of this number theory and abstract algebra in real life. How to get this big prime numbers, whether this is really a prime or how much time it takes to get this big numbers. You'll be surprised to know that my laptop, my small laptop can find this big prime numbers maybe within 40 seconds or maybe within 50 seconds. And if you are dealing with a very big machine with an efficient parts and all efficient hardware, you'll certainly get this big primes within maybe 10 seconds or so on. So that means finding this big primes is not a difficult task in today's scenario. But how to get this big prime? How do you be so sure that this big number is really a prime? So that's a big question. And to answer this question, abstract algebra plays an important role. So in our undergraduate study, both statistics as well as in mathematics, we also even in for engineering background students, they also have to uh, deal with linear algebra. So when we deal with linear algebra, mostly we think that linear algebra is mostly based on this uh, system of linear equations and solving system of linear equations and then dealing with some kind of matrices and all. So the question that comes to our mind is, is there any real application of linear algebra? Of course, there are plenty of. So all of us, we are basically fond of uh, looking at this animated movies. And you will be surprised to know that this linear transformation so those who are studying mathematics, they must be uh, knowing about this linear transformation. So it's a kind of similar concept like a homomorphism from group or ring or field homomorphism. So in case of a vector space, this linear transformation plays a similar role like in a group homomorphism or ring homomorphism. So this linear transformation plays an important role in get, getting this graphics and getting this kind of uh, movement or this kind of animated movies could be made the, by using this kind of linear algebraic techniques. So especially for the mathematicians, not for mostly for mathematicians, but for engineering students, MATLAB is a very common uh, software by which they will do lots of big calculations very easily. And the full form of MATLAB is matrix laboratory. So you can understand that the whole uh, principle behind this MATLAB is basically the matrix and this matrix is dealt in with uh, this linear algebra and all. So sometimes we listen uh, songs and sometimes we make uh, compress our data by using this deep and all and there also linear algebra plays an important role. So nowadays this big data analytics they are buzzwords and I'm sure that in uh, the previous speakers, they have already given you enough idea how these big data are. And in case of big data analysis, the linear algebra plays really an important role. So this uh, nowadays, this uh, for this big data boom, uh, linear algebra is nowadays very uh, important in our day-to-day -day life. So let us try to have a discussion about how uh, we are basically using the data. So it's a little old data. It's a data from 2019. It says that Google processes over five exabyte of data per day. So one exabyte means 10 to the power nine GB. Can you believe? So Google processes five into 10 to the power nine GB per day and that too in 2019. Within this lockdown period, I don't have the statistics with me currently, but I am searching for that. The similar data will be much bigger. 
uh, so it's much more fold than what we had in 2019 so google handles 1.2 trillion searches every year 1 trillion means 10 to the power 12 facebook generates 4 petabyte of new data per day 1 petabyte means 10 to the power 6 gb huge 4 into 10 to the power 6 gb data per day 350 million photos are uploaded per day users generate 4 million likes every minute so now you can understand how big whatsapp also 500 million user it possesses more than 70 million messages a second 70 million messages a second now you can understand how much uh, big data that we are dealing with and as a result we are actually dealing with big data and of course the security or how should we deal with the big data or what are the inferences or what are the info in information that are stored within that big data is a challenging question so for business analytics you can understand that you have too much data of lots of customers and from there you are you want to extract the most important data or most infor important information that will be helpful to expand your uh, business or just that will be more profitable for you that you are actually trying to find. So what kind of questions that you are asking is very important in case of big data. At the same time, while dealing with lots of data, the security aspect is also very important because suppose you, you are uh, you many, I mean, your uh, many information like your name, date of birth and all, along with your biometrical data are also stored inside your uh, this other card so the huge so you can understand the population of india those who are having this other card so huge amount of data is stored in some place or maybe distributed in some places and the security of all those data is very important so as a result cyber security plays an important role At the same time when we talk about the communication, for example, uh, suppose we are having the cable channels or we are having the mobile phones, the wireless communication. Not only that, from satellite, we get a lot of images, say, for example, moon or maybe Mars image. So we'll get a lot of images. And when the signal comes from a satellite through the atmosphere, the signal got distorted. Uh, by means of some say uh, nature or some uh, some ultraviolet ray or something then when we receive that distorted data by using linear algebra so basically that by using some linear uh, code or by using some error correcting code we sometimes remove all the distortion that already had been happened with uh, that data that means if some error happened within some limit then that data can be, uh, this error can be removed from the data to get the original data. That's why we get the almost original image that was, that are usually sent from the satellite by using linear uh, algebra, most, mostly some error correcting techniques and uh, the linear codes are basically nothing but the elements of a vector space. So in case of a linear algebra and the coding theoretic techniques are very much Co-related. That's why linear algebra plays an important role there also. So as I mentioned, cybersecurity plays an important role. And in my talk, I'll basically talk mostly on cybersecurity and a glimpse how uh, linear algebra could be useful into our day-to-day -day life. So as I mentioned, a huge amount of data usually we uh, every day we deal with. Uh, so lots of activities we do usually with this very weak data. Uh, for example, we check our email, we uh, download things, we chat with somebody, we play online, we buy something, we see news using our YouTube or direct telecast, etc. So many of the days, I mean, whole of the days we stay busy with lots of data. And as you understand that in all these applications, you need to put some password. So now you will have lots of plenty of passwords and the best thing is that if you can remember all the passwords so that that can be stored at your brain but there are some passwords which are very big for example when google they store so if you pay some money to google to protect your data usually all the data with all the service that usually google 
provides us are free but sometimes if you have more data then you need to pay some money to google and it says that it's taken from the google website itself it says that if you are if they are protecting your data then so suppose this is your whole data then it's actually get into a, they make it pieces and each of the pieces are being encrypted by some key okay and then this encrypted data are being stored separately now what it says that each of these key so these keys are called a uh, key encryption key and these all these key encryption key again then been encrypted by another key and that is done by google's key management service so kms so that means you had once you had a key and then all these keys are being again encrypted by another key and that particular key is being stored by using this google's key management system now you can understand that this big key i mean they are all automated keys nobody is there to uh, find your keys or to make your keys so everything is being done automatically and according to google all these keys are distinct even if they are coming from a same uh, piece of information they are all distinct that means huge amount of keys they need to store as a result and the size of these keys are very big for example they use for key management scheme they use aes 256 or rsa or something elliptic curve crypto system and they require uh, the keys like this so each of the keys might be of this size or even bigger than this so you can understand that nobody can remember this big numbers okay so you have to store somewhere so if you are going to store somewhere uh, then if you if that is being stored or that is being attacked or that is being uh, hijacked or that is being destroyed then you can understand you will be nowhere that's why you have to make a copy of the same thing at different places now you can very easily understand that if you make a copy of the same thing and place it differently at different places then the probability of losing the data is more so you need to make some extra things so that this data can be stored properly so data storing is an important aspect for not only for you but also for big giant like google uh, microsoft everywhere the securing data is an important issue so in this talk i will try to explain few of these techniques uh, but since uh, i will not give you much more mathematical details on this just give a kind of hints or give give certain uh, concepts how they are being done uh, so that you will get at least some idea at the end of the day so the question is how these keys can be stored securely okay for that in cryptography we use a special kind of technique known as secret sharing so let me first try to explain what is secret sharing suppose we have three friends they are very good looking and these three friends they want to uh, from their dresses you it's quite clear that what could be their profession and they decide that whatever income they will have they will put all their income inside a box but since they are very honest they don't have belief on each other so one friend don't believe other friend so whatever they decide that so they will put all their income inside the box and they will keep a lock and key and this lock and key should be such that that to open that lock at least two friends should be present that means for a single friend it should not be possible to open the key or open the lock but there should be at least two friends if all the three friends are agree to open the lock it should be fine but it should be at least two friends should be present to open that lock that means the normal lock and key will not be sufficient a special person in cryptographic term we call him as dealer who will be present who will basically uh, give each of these participants uh, some of the keys and if at least two of them they will present to open uh, they can open the lock and for a single friend it should not be possible to open the lock after giving this lock and key the dealer will disappear and uh, the each of the friends will operate on their own 
So this kind of scheme in cryptographic sense, we call them threshold signet sharing scheme. So here it says that T and W be two positive integers such so that T less than equal to W. A TW threshold scheme is a method of sharing a key K among a set of W participants. W participant, in my example, the W was three in such a way that any T participant can compute the value of K. That means any two or more participant can compute the value of K, but no group of T minus one participant can do so. So T minus one means in K, my case, T was two. That means one participant cannot be able to compute the value of K. So here computing the value of K means they are able to open the locker. So that's the idea of threshold scheme. So those who have the idea of going to the bank locker, they might have seen this kind of concepts uh, where there are two keys for a bank locker. One key is with the customer and another key is with the bank manager or somebody else from the bank. If both those two keys are being joined and both the keys are operated simultaneously, then only the bank locker opens. That means it should not be possible for the bank manager to open the bank locker alone. Similarly, it should not also be possible for a particular customer to open his bank locker without the help of the bank manager or somebody from the bank. So that's why this is a 2-2 scheme. That means the locker is being distributed over two participants in such a way. If both of them, they agree to open, then only the locker should be opened. Similarly, when we launch some missile, suppose uh, in some country, uh, they have a very powerful missile at their hand. So the control of the missile is not given to a particular person because if somebody wants to launch the missile at any time, then it could be a disaster. That's why the control of the missile is being given among a set of participants, for example, say general, uh, maybe the prime minister, then the defense minister. If at least say two or three of them, they agree to launch the missile, then only the missile could be launched. That means it should not be possible for some forbidden set of participants, those who are not qualified to launch the missile, for them, it should not be possible to launch the missile. So that's the idea. Similar kind of idea you might have seen when you have the new credit card or debit card at your hand. So it comes through post, right? So nowadays it's not happening, but say uh, at least uh, two years back, it happened that uh, the pin of that credit card or debit card, it the pin usually doesn't come with the original card. The pin comes after a few days of coming the physical of the physical uh, appearance of this original card. That means the card and the uh, pin are not coming to you simultaneously. Similarly, when we buy something online, so we have to give all the details about this credit card or debit card. And sometimes you also have to make the OTP. And OTP comes to your registered mobile. That means it's a kind of binding. It's a kind of authentication that you are doing. So it's not like you buy something by using only credit card insertion of your credit card number. It also distributes the whole thing among your laptop as well as your mobile, your register SIM, etc. That means the whole thing is being distributed among few more devices or few more authentications are required for getting your money or buying something using online uh, transaction. So let us try to now uh, see how uh, this can be done or how uh, this can be uh, achieved. Okay, till now, anybody has any question? If you have any question till now, you are free to ask me. Okay, any, any question till now? You can unmute yourself and ask me the question if you have any. Okay, so if not, then I will go to construction of some scheme. Okay. Okay. So suppose I want to construct a 2-2 scheme and uh, Japan is my password and suppose he is the dealer. This dealer wants to give the password among these two participants in such a way if both of them they will come they will get the password back but it should not be possible for one to get the password. Okay. So a simple way could be uh, the dealer has given jab to this guy, this girl, and and to this boy. If both of them, they will come, 
they will get japan and they will get the password but if you think a little deeply then you understand that this scheme is not a very good scheme why because if this girl comes to know that all the password alphabets are in capital and this boy will give two letters after her then what she can do she can guess the last two alphabets and he she knows that the number of choices could be 26 square many because she has to get only two of the places and the, for each place the number of options is 26 so there will be only 26 square many such options she has to guess similarly for that boy it will be 26 cube many options okay so the point is if for the girl if you look at the girl the information that the girl has is basically 60 percent of the password and for the boy he possesses 40 percent information about the password so we consider this kind of schemes as uh, not a very good scheme because in both cases the boy and the girl they knows uh, many i mean the amount of information they has they have are significant so we want a scheme in which uh, this should not happen let us try to have a look at this kind of scheme okay let me open up paint okay till now any question if you have please let me know So, okay, so suppose uh, I want to have a better scheme. Suppose here my password is this 011010 and the dealer wants to distribute the same like the previous case, something to this girl, something to this boy. Now what the dealer will do? Suppose the dealer has some unbiased coin. So what do you mean by unbiased coin? The probability of getting hit and getting tail is exactly half. Suppose you uh, toss the coin and then the probability of getting hit and the probability of getting tail is exactly half. That is known as unbiased coin. So if we have much more time, then we can discuss a very nice game uh, with this random uh, event and all. But uh, at this point of time, I'm not going to that. Suppose this uh, dealer has some random choice. And suppose the dealer has decided if he, he, if he gets head, he will put one. And if he has tail, he will put zero on a string, uh, on a paper. So what he does, he first have a look at how many, how many bits are there in this password. So it's six bit password. So what he does, he makes a, uh, coin toss for six times so consecutively he makes a coin toss for six times as a result what he will get he will get some strings of heads and tails and he can convert these heads and tails into zeros and ones by this rule if he gets head he put one if he gets tail he will put zero as a result after uh, tossing the coin for six times he will get a sequence of zeros and ones suppose this is his sequence of zeros and ones okay now you can understand that this is a random sequence of zeros and ones because the probability of getting one and zero are exactly half okay now he keeps this random string to this girl now you can understand that okay uh, since this is a random string from this string uh, the guessing about this uh, secret is really difficult because why difficult because it's a random string and there is no relation between this uh, this uh, secret as well as this random string except for the length okay now what to give to this boy now what he does he does this part so this is the secret and this is the random string what he does he gives it makes an XOR operation. So for mathematician, for engineers, XOR operation is XOR operation is uh, quite well known. It's a Boolean operation like Boolean AND and OR. 
for mathematician it's also very easy it's nothing but addition modulo 2 that means if you have both say 1 1 that means it should be 0 if you it's 2 and in modulo 2 this value is 0 so 0 1 it gives you 1 1 0 it gives you 1 and it will be 0 again if both of them are 0 so that's the truth table for XOR operation okay so for engineers XOR is like this and for mathematician it's nothing but addition modulo 2 bitwise that's all so what he does he does addition modulo 2 or XOR operation bitwise among this so this was the secret and this was the random string generated as an outcome of the six times coin tossing process and whatever he gets make a XOR operation and he gives it to him like see here 0 1 means 1 modulo 1 is 1 1 1 here the value is 2 modulo 2 is 0 0 0 is 0 1 0 is 1 1 1 is 0 and 0 0 is 0 so he gets this now you can understand this okay this is a random string so for this girl it may be very difficult to guess about this now this is you may think that okay this may not be a random string because the secret was involved and then it was odd with a random string then there might be some extra information inside this so let us try to analyze that what is happening so here i have one coin tossing event so suppose say probability of suppose this is uh, getting coin tossing say t equal to zero means t equal to okay it's t is already there so maybe coin coin tossing i can say like c c equal to coin tossing event say equal to zero that means getting head equal to same as probability c equal to one that means coin tossing event is head is basically half that is already given so here it was a secret and there must be some distribution on the secret so suppose s is my secret random variable suppose s to be zero suppose is the probability of s to be zero is p and suppose then the probability of s to be one because it's a binary string so it must be one minus p now i am trying to calculate what is the probability when the secret s is sort with the coin tossing event c so what is the probability the secret x sort with this c okay what is the when this will be zero what is the probability that uh, secret and this uh, coin tossing event that is the random event when you are making it a zor what would be the probability that this is zero now when it would be zero when both the secret and the coin is both of them are zero both of them are zero or both of them are one okay that means probability of s to be zero and probability c to be 0 or that means plus probability s to be 1 and probability c to be 1. Now what is that probability s to be 0 so is p so p and c to be 0 is half plus probability s to be 1 is 1 minus p and c to be 0 is c to be 1 is half. Now if I take a half common what I will get? I'll get p plus 1 minus p and that is nothing but half. Now what it gives actually, it says that if, if you have a random sequence, this is the random sequence, if you make ZOR with some any, having any probability distribution, after making it a ZOR, the probability of 0 to be half, that means after making ZOR with C, which is a random, that whole thing becomes random because why because the probability is c to be one is also half because they are binary so if zero is half then one has to be half that means they are basically random that means after making a zor with this random string that is also become half as a result this guy will have no extra information that means suppose he has this and he wants to guess what could be the value of zero because this is a random event so from here he will not have any guess about what would be this value okay 
so this boy will not have any extra information about the cigarette similarly this girl has no extra information about the cigarette now suppose you are a third person you are outsider now no information means suppose he has this this bit he wants to guess what is this bit as i mentioned the probability of guessing this is basically half now if i ask you the question you being a third person you do not have any share so we call it as a share you do not have any share now i want to ask you the question that what could be the probability of this bit to be half uh, to be zero because you have only two options either it could be zero or one so the probability of guessing it correctly is exactly half similarly for this boy even if he has the share with him the probability of guessing this correctly is also half because it's a random string and it was again a random string so probability if she has this he knows this last bit and she wants to guess the last bit of the secret the probability of guessing it correctly for her or for him is also half like you who are outside the participant range so you don't have any share but still the probability of guessing it correctly is exactly same as this boy and girl who do have the shares with them that means both this girl and the boy alone will not have any extra information about the secret except the length and the binary nature of the secret like you but when they come together and when they are going to make an xor operation about these two shares they will get back this secret that's why this kind of schemes are known as perfectly secure secret sharing scheme so in this uh, class i'll just uh, going to give you a very simple technique of constructing this kind of scheme but it's uh, quite interesting it will be done visually that means in every cryptographic scheme you have to calculate things while you are getting back the secret but here i am going to give you an example where you don't have to do anything no calculation is required only a visual uh, uh, thing is sufficient for you to get back okay just i i ask some of you for a voluntary can you please uh, write your name in the chat box whose name will come first i will uh, take that name for for uh, for my experiment only that name not him or her so could you please type your name on the chat box okay rita okay thank you so suppose my secret is so here the secret is indria and here my secret will be rita so let us try to find how it's uh, how it will be done okay so here i'll just type rita okay so rita is my secret password okay i'll just i will cut it okay i'll just save it i'll save it as secret image this is by this and now i'm going to write a not write i just going to run a uh, python program uh, yes. so it will generate few of the shares just a minute uh, it has already i think it has already generated the shares yes so rita was my secret and it has generated three of the shares so what is happening here so this rita is my password and i want to distribute this password or i want to distribute say among three participants in such a way that they are going to each of this is my share so let me just show you how the shares look like uh, so here is my share so insert image upload I'll upload it from machine so this is my share one and let me put another share image so this is my share two okay now these are my two shares and these shares the dealer will give this share printing on transparent paper you know what is the transparent sheets so 
the dealer will print this shares these random looking images on two transparent sheets okay now let me check what is happening now when one transparent sheet is superimposed over other that will give the rita back what is happening here so here we have two shares two transparent sheets you can see two transparent sheets now if i superimpose one transparent sheet over other you can see that this is the uh, more blacker portion if i increase that it will look more blacker if i increase that this will look and if i superimpose one after another properly not even superimposed properly not even superimposed so let me superimpose properly yes when they are superimposed one after another properly then you will get the password then you can understand the name rita came back but if you just distort it a little bit you will find that it becomes it vanishes it vanishes it requires a steady hand to just put one after another so that is the very interesting idea so this is known as visual cryptography because it's completely done visually so you don't have to calculate anything you just need to superimpose one transparent sheet over other properly and when you superimpose properly then you get back the information and it should not be possible that i need to prove mathematically that from one transparent sheet you should not get any information about rita so that's quite important so that's why this is known as visual cryptography because it's done completely through visual system okay so here the password was inria and when this two transparent sheets they are printed the shares are being printed on two transparent sheets when they are superimposed you get the inria back so the question is how did i make this or what is the mathematics behind that so they are based on this of our papers okay so let us let me quickly do it uh, on the not here maybe on on yes here okay let us try to explain the whole thing okay so uh, as you understand that the picture was a black and white image so it was a black and white image so as you know that in black and white image you will have some pixels so pixels are either black or white so you know nowadays you all use this my pixel my uh, camera is that megapixel my camera is that megapixel etc so if it's a completely black and white image then this image is basically made up of suppose this is a black and white image so this black and white image is basically made up of if you zoom it in computer if you zoom it then you will find that each of this small part of the image is basically made up of small boxes so each box is either black or white so if you zoom say this part of uh, image you will find that this image is basically made up of few boxes and this box is either completely black or white completely white so each of these boxes small boxes are known as pixels okay so these pixels are the ingredients or the building blocks of this image now how to use this concept so my aim is to construct a two to scheme but before that let us try to have a look at the basic mathematics behind it okay so here what we are going to do so if i ask you the question have you ever taken your printout this black and white printout suppose you have a purely black and white printout not a color printer printer suppose you have a black and white printers and have you ever taken any of the printout on a black paper if i ask you the question have you ever taken the printout uh, on a black paper so usually we take the printout on a white paper so why we usually do not take the printout on a black paper anybody can anybody give me some answer why 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 uh why it's not the case why we do not take the uh take the thing take the print out on a white page uh, on a black page anybody
anybody big yes please unmute yourself yeah no so someone uh, wrote it sir i was just going to say that uh, since the picture itself is in black yes so since the picture is itself in a black so of course in a black and white uh, when we take a print out uh, the ink is black and it's purely black so if the image has some part in white for example suppose my image is like this in a white portion suppose my image is the this part is completely black and the, i have a circle complete circle which is completely white and if i take a print out of that uh, what ink the printer will eject here so the printer is not going to eject anything if it is white the printer will eject the black ink or the black point only when it's a black okay that's why if you take this on a black and white paper then suddenly it will be completely black because that part was default black and outside will also be black due to the ejection of the ink so you will not be able to distinguish if it's uh, i mean you may able to distinguish but uh, mostly you cannot see it that's why the contrast is very less because the black and white contrast will be very less that's why we do not take anything any print for black and white we usually take in the on the white page okay so what is actually happening so if i have a black pixel and if i print it on a transparent sheet and if i have a white pixel so what is the meaning of white pixel on a transparent sheet that means the printer did not eject any ink here that means it's basically the original transparent sheet nothing is ejected that's why we call it white and why this is black because the printer already ejected black ink onto it okay that's why it's black when we are going to superimpose one after another suppose this is a black pixel or the black part printed on a transparent sheet and this is the white part printed on a transparent sheet that means nothing is printed on it now if i superimpose one after another as an effect what color should we see anybody what would be the color that we should see anybody yeah please unmute yourself yes so somebody has already written it should be the black yes perfect so if we have say here white and here black what color should we see here also we will see black now if we have both black then also we see black and if both of them are white that means transparent then as an effect we will suddenly see the transparent effect of this now do this superimposition operation remind something from your boolean algebra anything that you remember from your boolean algebra any operation that you think of the idem potency idem potency okay a square equal to a you are talking about uh, any operation i am not talking about uh, this property but i am talking about some binary operation that you think of or yes in boolean ring the idem potency is preserved that's good but i i talk about i am looking for uh, some binary operation any binary operation that you may think of so binary operation binary composition what are the binary compositions that you are taught in your boolean algebra course random or operation okay or operation somebody said me or operation and, and somebody told or and i must say that both of them are correct depends how you are encoding if you write black for 1 and white for 0 then what you are getting so this is 0 1 1 1 1 1 and 0 0 0 now can you guess what is this operation this is binary 1 1 0 gives you 1 so this is binary or operation very good now you just replace it by 
other way around if i replace it by say this is by 0 and this is by 1 then what you are getting you are getting 1 this is 1 this is 0 you are getting 0 sorry it is 0 this is getting 0 this is 0 you are getting 0 1 1 1 now tell me what is that 0 1 gives you 0 1 0 gives you 0 0 0 gives you 0 1 1 gives you 1 then what is would be the operation and it should be okay so it depends if you represent black by 1 and white by 0 then it would be your binary or operation that means the physical superimposition operation is nothing but your binary or operation that's very interesting so that's here the application of mathematics lies here see we do many physical operations many physical things without knowing the behind the mathematics is what is the mathematics behind here is a very interesting example where the simple boolean or operation or and operation could be interpreted nicely when you are going to superimpose something okay so now we are in mathematics so now i am going to explain you how this scheme can be constructed so i want to construct the 2 2 visual visual cryptographic scheme we call it vcs okay so suppose so what is the aim so the dealer has two participants and the idea is if both of them they will join only then only the image should be recovered okay so how this can be done so the dealer ha must have some algorithm to do so so the dealer is basically trying to give the algorithm for two pixels one is for black pixel and another is for white pixel now if we can do so for black pixel and white pixel then he can apply this algorithm to whole image because i know that my secret image is either black image or white image i mean the pixel of each uh, pixel must be either white pixel or white uh, black pixel so if i have some algorithm for black pixel and white pixel then we are basically done we shall apply the everything on this image because i know that this uh, image must be made up of small pixels and i'll check what is the first pixel if it is a black pixel i'll come here and i will do the application so what he does for black pixel in each of this transparent sheet so there are two transparent sheets right so transparent sheet one and transparent sheet two that means this is for participant one this is for participant two for the first transparent sheet he prints one black one white for the second transparent sheet he prints one white one black now if you are going to superimpose one after another properly then as an effect what you will see you will see two black because this over this will give you black and this over this will give you black so you'll, as an effect you will get two black pixels the same thing could also be done by using this so this is white and then black then what should be this this is first black and then white if we're going to superimpose them you will also get two black pixels okay now for white what happens for white he has two of first white and then maybe two black and here also he gives one white one black when they are going to superimpose they will get one white one black now this thing may also be done using this one black and white so here also one black one white when they are going to superimpose they will get one black one white now i'm telling that this is the algorithm now let me explain how this algorithm works so you can understand that for black pixel he has two options this option or this option for white pixel also he has two options one option or this option so he will make a coin toss here if he gets head he will take this path if he gets tail he will get this path Similarly here, if he gets head, he will take this path. If he has tail, he will take this path. So what is the algorithm now? 
the dealer will check the first pixel of the secret image if the first pixel is a white pixel he will come here and make a coin toss suppose he gets tail then what he, he will do he will print this part to the first transparent sheet and this part to the second transparent sheet so when you superimpose one after another you will get basically one black one white suppose the second pixel is a black pixel suppose this is a black pixel he comes here he will again make a coin toss suppose he gets tail head so he will print this pix two pixels just beside the uh, pixel that he already printed on the first transparent sheet and on the second transparent sheet he will put another and so on so that's the algorithm for each pixel he will do the coin tossing so this is a random event now what i need to show you that if both of them will come together then for black he is getting two black pixel whereas when they will two of them will come they will get for white they will get one black and one white but still here the black portion is more but here the white portion is i mean black portion is less that's why there will be a contrast difference and our visual system is very strong that's why we can distinguish this see you can see that the background of this image was completely white but here the background of the image is not complete white it's a gray but still you can distinguish for black one this is more black and for white which was the background of this inria was now become gray because it has less black compared to the black portion here that's why the visual system can visually recover this to contrast and they can get it, get it back to you and so you get this scheme now what i need to show that suppose one participant they came and they want to guess whether it comes from black or white suppose one participant has this share and he wants to guess whether it comes from white or black so it comes really from black but you see that the same pattern is also present here that means out of this four patterns two patterns are of the same type that means the probability of guessing it correctly is exactly 2 by 4 that means half now think about yourself you do not have any share you know that the pixel is either black or white now what is the probability of guessing it correctly for you also it is exactly the half as a result the probability with which the participant having a share will guess it correctly is half is same as the probability that you being the third person who do not even have a share will guess it correctly with the probability exactly same as this guy that means this guy will not have any extra advantage having only one share but if both the shares will join then only both of them will get the knowledge that you do not have as a third person but both of them they will able to get the original image back but for a single participant it should not be possible to get the secret back that's why this is known as perfectly secure secret sharing scheme and that's a visual cryptographic schemes and uh, many of such uh, schemes can be uh, generated and for engineers it's very easy to implement you can use c or python code to implement this i have implemented is using python and many researchers are going on and uh, lots of linear algebra can also be used very easily here to get nicer schemes so i'm not going to details about all those schemes rather i will uh, wait for a few questions or queries if you have then uh, but i'm before that i must acknowledge google for providing me nice images and my scholars and of course my project uh, the government support from department of information technology government of india drdo and yz from ministry of defense dst surf dst matrices dst fist nbhm so this two japanese project jsps and jst from government of japan for providing me supports to perform all the uh, research work that usually i do uh, so if you have any question or comments you are free to ask me or you can send me email to this id so Uh, visual thank you to all of you
Uh, any question? If uh, not. So if you have any question, you can directly Is ask there? me. আহ অভিষেক বাবু আপনার ইয়েটা চ্যাট বক্সে দিয়ে দিতে পারেন মেলটা যদি ওর কোনো क्वेश्चन टोस्टिंग থাকে ওরা আচ্ছা আচ্ছা সো ইউ ক্যান সেন্ড মি মাই ইউনিভার্সিটি আইডি ওরা তাহলে হ্যাঁ ইউনিভার্সিটি আইডি ওখান থেকে ওরা क्वेश्चन করতে পারে এনিওয়ে ইফ देयर इज नो क्वेश्चन देन थैंक यू प्रोफेसर অধিকারী ফর দিস Uh, just one thing huh? uh, if you are interested in this basic number theory courses and all so you can search my name in google uh, i have a youtube channel where i this year i have taken courses at residency university for this undergraduate level students to explain the basic number theory and its application to uh, cryptography uh, with in details so now i am teaching them the graph theory and for if you are in a higher uh, level then i am teaching now this uh, ring theory course uh, with applications of course i like to show a few applications in real life so that you can also have a look at that so uh, systematically all the uh, things are given there so if you are interested you can have a look uh, at this thing okay thank you thank you thank you professor dikesh for this wonderful derivation and uh, uh, the valuable talk you have given that reflecting your in depth knowledge in the subject which has widely widely encouraged us and enriched us as well thank you thank you very much uh, one or two things before uh, the last part a uh, vote of thanks i want to mention one or two things uh, you, uh, i have already said you about the feedback form you see it is uh, already the feedback form link for the feedback form is given under dr ajoy shen in chat box you get the link uh, there are two entries actually you see for the uh, under ajoy shen dr ajoy shen so but the first one is not second one it is written over there at 117 pm that is the feedback form given in the chat box so you just go to that link and uh, please fill up the uh, feedback form for preparing to for preparing, helping us for preparing the your e certificate number 1 number 2 uh, i am asking mr kushal shen uh, he may um he may uh, upload some some link for you if you have any question any queries about big data anything then mr shen can answer you uh, through that link so i just give me one second i may ask kushal mm. Just a minute. I may ask Kushal to upload his link. Hello, Kushal. Uh, are you online? Are you present, Kushal? Hello. Up, uh, Mrs. Kushal Shen. Are you here? Are you present? Anyway, 
है बाई दिस टाइम मे आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर पांचाली मुजुमदार for uh, dr panchali mujumdar is coordinator of iqac of his calcutta uh, girls college for delivering the vote of thanks by this time uh, i will contact kushal and tell him uh, to upload his link and ha aap jo hai sun फॉर्म लिंक You just fill up the uh, feedback form, please. Now, Dr. Panchal Mujumdar will deliver the vote of thanks. Hi, what happened? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Janta Babu, for introducing me. Thanks for and Dr. Panchali Mujumdar is coordinator of IQAC of East Calcutta Girls College <laughs> and very active. She is. No, no. Hello. We all uh, work here as a team, and all the teachers and uh, non-teaching staff of our colleges, all of them, are actively participated in every sort of activities that are conducted by our institution. and today we have the opportunity to conduct this sort of webinar uh, so that we can reach the farthest corner of the society including the education that started from the school level to up to the higher education and here today we have the college students with us previously in the webinars there were a lot of number of uh, school students who were actively participated in the isi workshops and uh, first of all in the vote of thanks i want to convey on behalf of physical kata girls college our regards to professor dimon kumar roy whose initiative has made it possible on behalf of physical kata girls college we also convey our regards to professor bashur chowdhury vice chancellor west bengal state university who apart from his busy schedule as an active going on in university he has attended the webinar and encouraged us a lot to continue the journey professor bimal sir has always put a light on the pathways for the students particularly the young ones who will host the flag of the nation in future we are the privileged one to have him with us here we have with us our respected principal madam dr shukla hazra without whose active encouragement or active participation we can't proceed one step in our institution she always encourages us to do the things that will be helpful for the benefit of the society and on behalf of east calcutta girls college we all the teachers the non teaching staff and the students we have the opportunity or we are the privileged one to have her with us thank you madam thanks a lot i'd like to convey our regards and thanks to professor shubhamoy moitro professor pinak panipal from isi mr kushal shen from microsoft corporation professor abhishek odhikari from presidency university who have delivered their lectures in these webinars and i think the students are 
been uh, they are uh, very much benefited by this uh, uh, webinar which shows a pathway for them at last i want to thank dr ajay shin the teacher head of the department of mathematics is calcutta girls college for conducting this uh, uh, webinar and lastly i want to thank professor joyanto ghosh without his cooperation without his help we can't do this sort of uh, program so uh, thanks to uh, joyanto babu also for every cooperation and help he always is with us with his calcutta girls college and Uh, giving every effort for to success all these sort of webinar uh, we hope that in in the future we also have him with us so thank you joyanto babu so much for conducting for your nice uh, you have nicely conducted this webinar thank you so much thanks to all the participants who have participated in this webinar all the students uh today's participants and the students who have participated a lot in the uh, previous webinars also on behalf of his calcutta girls college without his active participation we the all these webinars are meaningless so uh, thank you so much thank you jant babu jant babu jant babu can you hear me hello <laughs> Okay. thank you thank okay. you very much uh, dr mujumdar uh, lastly uh, probably kushal shen has joined kushal has joined yes i am here hi everyone okay you please uh, upload your uh, yeah uh, so, link uh, in the um, this is um, uh, in the chat box right uh, so i'm going to so share the uh, participants if they are interested they can ask questions and uh some interactions may do some interactions with you yeah sure uh so i'm and going to once again i uh, yes in chat box you can give this the link and uh, once again i want to remember i uh, want to mention uh for filling up the feedback form by the participants so that we can uh, send them the certificate is certificate ar kushal babu apni ekta kore din ni eta tahole ha i have shared uh, the qna link and the link to the slide so you can access mm -hmm. the slide uh, over there and the qna link is for any questions of uh, that you may have after you go through the document or as we have it right now Uh, so just share your uh, doubt or whatever questions you have regarding any of the topic uh, discussed in the Q&A link uh, regarding the big data, uh, and we'll be happy to uh, respond to them. We'll have to be individually answering uh, to each one. Of them. So, so thank you, everyone. Uh, And thanks to Bajan uh, sir for organizing okay. this. Okay, and Abhishek Babu also uh, have given. Uh, Abhishek Babu also has given his link, uh, so that any participant can interact with him. So both Abhishek Babu and Kushal Babu has given. So thank you, thank you very much for joining this session. And this webinar. i think everyone enjoyed thank you thank you very much so we can stop over here and please uh, fill up the uh, feedback form okay ajoy ki achen ajoy shen ajoy ki connected হ্যাঁ তাহলে আজকে এন্ড করছি এখানে তাহলে রেকর্ডিং আমি অফ করছি
ওরা ওই ফর্মটা যদি ফিলআপ করে এটা বোধহয় একটুখানি সময় খোলা থাক নাকি ঠিক আছে কোনো কোনো সুবিধা নেই তাহলে খোলা ফিলআপ করার জন্য ঠিক আছে 10 15 মিনিট খোলা থাক ফর্ম খোলা থাক হ্যাঁ 10 15 মিনিট বড় খোলা থাক ফর্ম ফিডব্যাক ফর্ম গুলো ঠিক যারা যারা করে করে দিক হ্যাঁ সাউন্ডটা অফ করে খোলা থাক ঠিক আছে ওকে 